Uh, just before I, I just first of all will take any apologies. Have we any apologies? John? Uh, thanks, Chair. Councillor Catherine Kelly. Thank you. Victor? I think uh, Councillor Robert Irvine. Okay, thanks, Victor. Paul? Sir David Mahon, do you want to say an always thing in a minute, Only on apologies. Right. Okay. Um, and have we any other apologies? No. Okay, that's fair enough. Okay, before we go any further on the agenda, there's a couple of things that I want to cover. The first thing that I want to mention here is the uh, funeral today of uh, one of our long-term planners, uh, Jeffrey Armstrong, who unfortunately passed away very suddenly and was buried today. Uh, while I didn't know Jeffrey personally, uh, Anyone that I have spoken to about him uh, said that he was a thorough gentleman and uh, a wealth of experience and expertise uh, within the uh, council that will be uh, sadly uh, missed uh, in the time ahead and uh, a very a very sudden passing and uh, not that terribly long after the passing of his wife, unfortunately. Uh, so. Uh, that is is part of that. So I have a couple of uh, people that have indicated to come in and speak there. So the first one I'm going to take in is Barry. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the passing of the former Taoiseach, John Britton, um, very significant political figure, you know, didn't always agree with my ideology, sometimes strident opponent of Sinn Féin, but I have to acknowledge that he led a rainbow coalition 1994 to 1997. He had an involvement in the peace process um, and the office of Taoiseach is very significant, you know, as we witnessed again just yesterday with the re-establishment of the, the political institutions and the, the meeting of the executive where the current Taoiseach was present. And he, he did give significant public service. And uh, reconciliation is important on a, an all-island, north-south basis as well. Sometimes that's overlooked. So I just want to acknowledge the passing of former Taoiseach, uh, John Bruton, and give our sympathy to his wife and family, Fanola and family, and Richard Bruton, his, his brother. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Barry. Victor? Thank you, Chair, for letting me in, and just certainly on your condolences uh, regarding um, the death of Jeff. I was somebody who did know Jeff quite well, not so much from his life within councillor planning, but in, in my previous work, uh, he was a, a great visitor to our shop. He had a great love for music and a great love for guitar, so I, I knew Jeff quite well, so it was very sad, especially only a year after the death of his wife. Uh, so thanks for letting me in. Uh, thanks also for letting me in uh, on this. Uh, it's just on behalf of our party grouping, I would wish to offer our heartfelt wishes to His Majesty the King on the news of his cancer diagnosis. This is unfortunately a reality. Many families across our district faces day and daily. I know that the people of Fermanagh and Oma and indeed Northern Ireland and beyond will be holding him and the royal family through their thoughts and prayers during this worrying time for them all. I note the warm reception he received upon his visit to Fermanagh back in May, where he was met with cheers and warmth to the crowds waiting at uh, Enniskillen Castle. So again, as a grouping, we wish him all the best and a return to full health. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. OK, Victor. Patrick? Sorry, thanks, Chair. Um, on behalf of Sinn Féin, uh, I'd like to extend our condolences to Claire, Gronya, Kerry, Sinead, Kevin and the extended Harkin and Meenan families on the death of Brenton Harkin. Uh, Brenton was a true Irishman. He was everything you'd ever ask. A gale to the backbone in his beloved Kelly Glocher and indeed the massive role he played within Throne GA. He is a massive loss to his family, friends, his community and his football club and county. We are all better for Noah Brenton 
and we send our thoughts and prayers to all his extended family and friends. Okay. Uh, John, are you coming in on the same issue? Yeah, just to echo oh, Okay, go on ahead then. Yeah, just uh, I'd like to, on the behalf of the Sinn Féin group and as well, to wish Charles all the best. And, uh, and also, it was what Victor said too, as well said about the uh, families and of, of all across the district are suffering the same as what Charles Wins is suffering too. So, to all those families, friends of all cancer sufferers, we want to pay, pay our best wishes to them. And Bernard? Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to acknowledge to you the passing of Brendan Harkin, whose funeral took place uh, in Kilclaher yesterday, mon Monday the 5th of February. Brendan devoted his whole life to Kilclaher GA and Tyrone County Board, where he served two terms as County Chairman and ultimately Honorary County President and, and numerous other roles over a 60-year period, which we, which we will never see the likes of again. He was described by many as a quiet and modest man he did not actively seek the limelight for all he had achieved for parish and county. I think it's appropriate that we in this council extend our sincere sympathy to his wife, Claire, and his family and his wider circle of friends. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Bernard. Stephen? Hey, Chairman, and I'd like to be associated with the comments in relation to the late Brandon Harkin. And uh, just following on from Councillor Feely, uh, it is right that I suppose whenever someone receives bad news, like uh, King Charles of Britain has received bad news recently, uh, it's only right that we do send good wishes. And it'll be a great comfort, I suppose, to the members of the royal family at how quick he has been diagnosed with this illness and indeed how quick his treatment has started. So that'll be a comfort to them. However, in this district, uh, Chairman, and indeed across the north, the reality for cancer patients here is much different. You know, if you go to the GP with a, with a cancer-like symptoms and you're red flagged for a referral to the hospital, you can expect to wait three weeks and then a, that regularly is over is overshot. A, from getting a cancer diagnosis until treatment starting, you can expect to wait 62 days. And again, in the Western Trust area, a recent figures showed that only 33.7% of people a, were seen inside that time frame, which obviously adds to the to the, the distress and and the stress of all of all that. So yes, we do send, of course, good wishes to to King Charles of Britain. But also, my thoughts tonight are with all those who are starting out in that cancer journey or maybe going through that cancer journey. Indeed, I'd say very few families in this chamber haven't been touched by cancer, including me own. I mean, we know how painful it is. So my thoughts tonight are with all those on that path. Chair, thank you. Okay, thanks, Steve, and Earl. Up, oh, thanks for letting me on there, Chair. And first of all, on behalf of the Democratic Unionist Party Group and on from Alan Nobility Council, I want to extend uh, best wishes to King His Majesty King Charles III, uh, especially after getting this diagnosis of having cancer. And we think at this time also of Queen Camilla and the family circle. We wish him all the very best and hopefully he'll have a speedy and full recovery. And taking on board what Councillor McCann has said, you're, you're right, Councillor McCann, there's not a family uh, in this chamber that hasn't been affected by cancer in some form. Uh, my late father-in-law died a young man at 55 with it, so there's none of us escape it. So with those comments, I'll just leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, members. Now we're going to move on to uh, declarations of interest, if there is any. Oh, sorry, yes. I'm going to confirm the minutes. Sorry, I skipped that. I skipped there. So, Mark, if you can hold on that. Uh, to confirm and sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of January. And we're going to take them for accuracy first. So, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And if I can have a proposal, Paul, thank you. And Earl Sickening. Okay, we're going to take any matters arising or declarations of interest there. Did you have Mark? Sorry. There you go. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. And uh, let's get the agenda right up in front of me again. 
It's number yes. Earlier in the week, Chair, I was appointed special advisor to the Minister of Health again. So I know that'll cause some slight challenges, perhaps, in terms of declarations of interest. And I will try to declare as necessary through the meetings. I know, for instance, item number 4.1 tonight, I would need to declare a declaration of interest on that. Um, and ongoing in terms of any decisions relating to do with the health or with the health department or with the trust or anything like that. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on it. If I don't declare an interest, there's no malfeasance intended. Um, but generally speaking, I'll try to try to declare as I go along. Yep. Uh, so well, as every member knows, it's always up to the member to, to declare uh, conflicts of interest. OK. Thank you. Uh, Barry? No, nothing personal, but just uh, I was going to inquire about uh, the local government rules and regulations, or there may be none, around the appointment of a special advisor and being a councillor. I just was wondering that, so I'm just asking it out loud. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, certainly, well, I was unaware, obviously, until Councillor Evans announced this evening, but my understanding is there is no uh, nothing to prevent a member serving as a councillor and as a special advisor. As Councillor Robbins has indicated, it's then up to the member just to look at potential conflicts of interest and declare those accordingly. Okay. Seamus? Yeah, I would just, uh, I'm delighted to hear that because we have a fast track now straight to the Minister's office. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, bright things for the SWA and, and from Anna and Oma in general. With that, uh, members, um, I think we'll move to uh, take matters arising out of the uh, 9th of January. So, for well, matters arising, page one, two, three, okay, page two, Debbie. Thanks, Chair. Just um, under DFI, um, I'm, I'm really making a comment, really, um, about the disappointment uh, of the department because they haven't responded back to one um, issue that I sent in. I contacted the council official that the sheet was emailed to, and she's um, responded back and, and given me the um, email address of the person that it was sent to within the DFI. Um, and, um, and, and I'm in the process of following them up. But I mean, it, it's like February now, and those issues went in November, and not one of them, not one person's got back to me. So I'm very disappointed, and I just don't think that's acceptable. But like I said, I will be, you know, there's issues in Urbanstown and Tempo area. But I'm, I'll, I will follow them up myself, but I just wanted to, um, you know, express my disappointment at them not coming back to one item that was sent in November. Okay. Thanks, Sam. Stephen? Uh, thank you, Chair. And I'd appreciate maybe just a little bit of uh, latitude, just given that uh, DFI has come up just and on the subject of matters and correspondence that we are expecting. I know before the new year, we had the chance to consider that there would be an expectation that we would have a reply from DFI on their investigation into the feasibility study that we conducted around the flooding um, sort of work around OMA. And I know that it was anticipated that that would be available. I think it was said by the end of January, potentially early in the new year. And I'm just curious as to whether there's been any indication or correspondence so far. Okay. Yeah. No, Chair, just to confirm, we've received nothing further. We can certainly follow up again, but uh, we've had no further correspondence on the matter from the department. Okay, and moving on to page three, and I listen. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Just at the bottom of page three, correspondence from DFI. This is in relation to the designation of the Coalbrook River, um, and the department has advised they don't hold the relevant information. That would be an LPS matter, but they have included a map of the various areas of ownership. So, really, just for information, Chair. Okay. Do we need a? Just uh, a proposer and seconder, Bernard, thank you. And seconder, uh, Roy, thank you. Okay. And the hail's on three, four. 
you, Chair. Just uh, on page four, we have a response from the Department of Health regarding the Council's further correspondence and the lack of screening that was undertaken on the recent decisions for Listness Key. So really, the Permanent Secretary is advising that the screening was not undertaken because it was deemed it wasn't required, essentially. And they also provide some comment later in the letter regarding vasectomy provision as well. Okay. Nolene? Yes, thank you, Chair. It's also on the uh, response from the Department of Health. Um, um, to be fair, I appreciate the response, but it's exactly the same response that I got from that we got from the lap letter, and I've actually highlighted it. It is exactly the same, nearly word for word, and it's getting very frustrating. We specifically asked why that decision was made and how they came to that decision that a rural impact assessment was not needed, and they've answered exactly the same way as the letter before. Um, I mean, we're not here asking these questions for a joke. I really would appreciate if they took it a little bit more seriously and, and actually answered the question that we're asking. At what percentage would an impact assessment be merited in their opinion and why? Um, it's getting very, very frustrating. And I may also ask um, um, Alison, just in, in response to the government departments where they would undertake an um, inequality screening and rural needs assessment, do you have an answer on where, for us, for example, would take feel the need to take an assessment in that way? Chair, we did endeavour to get formal clarification on this, and it appears to be largely at the discretion of the department as to whether or not, and so issues maybe around urgency of decision making, financial or other matters, but it, there does appear to be a greyness around it. And I know that was something that was highlighted when the Rural Needs Act came out, that there was a concern that it may not actually have the required teeth, uh, but we weren't able really to get a very definitive response on the matter either. Okay, thank you. Okay, Seamus. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of things on that. Um, maybe Alison has already uh, uh, answered what uh, my first point was that on what Noling has asked there, uh, have we asked our legal uh, department uh, to clarify that and what their legal advice would be in around uh, uh, getting a rural needs impact assessment? The other thing is if indeed the Rural Needs Act hasn't got the teeth, uh, is there something as a council or a department that we can write to, to encourage now when uh, Stormont was up and running, that that can be reviewed and that the Rural Needs Act is actually given the teeth that it needs to uh, uh, be more than just a, a tick box exercise, because that's what it seems to be. And uh, the other thing, if the chair just lets me deviate for a, a, a slight bit. Hey, can uh, you hold that deviation just for one second till I check with Nolene? Nolene, are you happy to encompass all of what Seamus is suggesting there in the, the correspondence back to the department at this stage? That would help, I suppose. Yes. Okay. Yep. So and and uh, it's just, I don't think it's the Department of Health would have uh, the say on the Rural Needs Act. I think it's the, the Agricultural Department was the one that that uh, that brought that in first. And so maybe if we can write to them uh, and uh, ask or even to the Executive Office that that can be re-looked at and, and uh, that we feel as a Rural Council that the Rural Needs Act really is only a tick box exercise at this stage. The, the, the other thing I just okay, want... So can I just tie that off? So you're seconding Nolene's writing there yeah. to the department, and Nolene, I'm, I'm happy enough that you're seconding Seamus. Are we agreed, members, with all of that? Yep, Seamus. And on to... A, deviate. On to another letter that I'm looking to, to be wrote, and that's to the, the Minister of Health in relation to the Ski Health Centre. Uh, I was uh, wrote to the to the permanent secretary who told me that they were hoping that um, the spade would be in the ground this summer. So 
I think it might be a, a good thing for the council to also write and uh, ask that there is no more delays that, that because this is about the third or fourth delay there's been and it seems to be all that's put on the long finger that we are asking for no more delays that this is a critical piece of infrastructure in in uh, in our area and needs to be started asap so uh, i would propose that we write that as well okay thanks Seamus. and eddie thanks, chair happy to second that letter as well by the way um this is key health centers long overdue uh, the current situation is it's dilapidated and uh, it's not exactly an appealing location for uh, you know attracting new new qualified GPs to a to a lifetime of service in uh, a local community. So a new building and an infrastructure will go a long way to help secure healthcare in, in rural Fermanagh. Um, back to the, um, the the letter from from Peter May, um, I think. He knows himself that really that is a complete cut of service because the um, secondary care waiting list for the sector was already in the years. And when you add that now uh, on top of that, all the primary care for secondary patients, um, it, it's essentially going to be five plus years before anybody gets seen. Uh, so, you know, in reality, this is a complete cut of service. And I would hope that with a new minister in place that uh, and, and some funding on its way that we prioritise uh, elective care in primary care again to uh, to improve waiting lists across the board. Thank you. Okay, that's it. Josephine? Thank you, Chair. And uh, may I give my apologies, Chair, for coming late into the meeting. Chair, I do share Councillor Hayes' frustration in this matter. And, um, you know, uh, with the uh, appointment of a new Minister for Health, I'm really hoping that we are going to see things improve greatly in primary care. Uh, I totally support Councillor Green's proposal, seconded uh, by Councillor Roof. And uh, I just wondered if uh, there could be included in the letter to the Minister um, a request that funding for GP elective services is, uh, uh, is really um, reinstated without delay hopefully from the 1st of April uh, of this year. I think that would be important. Uh, and particularly, as Councillor Roof has said, the, the, the dire lack of vasectomy uh, services in secondary care is putting extreme pressure on, on people in our community. So if that could be added into the letter, Chair, I would be uh, greatly appreciative. Thank you. I'm sure that can be uh, added in. OK. Adam. Thank you, uh, Chair. I think this might be the ideal time to bring in one of my pieces of AOB. Um, now, as has been noted, we have an executive. It would be very timely for us as a council to revisit the issue of emergency general surgery at SWA. Um, I think we all can agree here that the current situation is life-threatening, uh, a life-threatening situation for people here uh, and of this district. And currently, we're all aware that the trusts haven't even tried to begin planning for a return of the service, uh, and that's a, a disgrace in my opinion. But now, at least positively, there is a minister in place, uh, and it will be the duty of that minister to bring that this service back. Uh, and given the, the level of public interest in this, this matter, I feel having a public engagement with the minister will be very vital and very important and appropriate. So I would like to propose that we invite Minister Swan to attend a special council meeting to discuss the issues surrounding the withdrawal of emergency general services or emergency general surgery to and to discuss uh, how he plans to bring the service back. Chair, thank you. Okay. Gavin? Thanks, Chair. I just a second Councillor Gann's proposal. Okay. We have two proposals. We have Seamus's seconded by Eddie. Uh, are we all agreed? And uh, we have Adams seconded by Garvin. Are we all agreed? Chair, just in relation to Councillor Green's comments regarding if we had sought any legal advice on the potential for the council or others to act, we haven't done that yet. But certainly, if that's which it is included in the proposal, we'll undertake to do that. Yep, so that's part of it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Anything else on four? Five. 
Uh, Chair, just on page five, firstly, uh, at the top item 6.3, to note correspondence from the Department for Communities regarding the um, civil service regional hubs and the Permanent Secretary advises that they are actively promoted within his department. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Post a note, just Chair. Thank you. That would be grand. Thank you. And Earl? Yeah, I, w I welcome the reply and the second the note. Okay. Sure. Thank you, members. And then, Chair, just further down the page, um, corresponds on the 24th of the January uh, from DERA. And this was our further request, really, for clarification on the term or the initials and terminology being used in the previous FOI response. So they are also considering that as a freedom of information request. So this is really just the acknowledgement of that. Okay, can I have a proposed and seconder? Gavin, thank you. And Mark. Okay, moving on. Anything else in five, six, seven? Okay. Chair, just to note, uh, item 68, the closure of Ulster Bank Listener Ski and to confirm that the meeting proceeded yesterday with representatives from the Financial Services Union uh, as indicated. Seamus? Um, yeah, I had went online to that meeting and I found some of the uh, the statistics uh, quite disturbing on it. Uh, one of them was that uh, when a bank closes, that I think it was uh, barren by businesses uh, in the local area decreased by 64% on average. It's a uh, quite shocking when you when you think of a, an area uh, like Lissenski Air and East that that's the type of impact that uh, you're having when we're trying to actually um, get rural areas revitalised and then banks purely out of greed and profit decide to close the last remaining bank open in the second biggest town in Fermanagh. So that is just one of the the stats that I thought was quite amazing. Okay, thanks, Seamus. Moving on to page eight. Thank you, Chair. Just to highlight correspondence from DFI, this is regarding members' concerns about uh, road markings or how those have been depleted, uh, and really the department's encouraging members, if they come across such areas, to log them online, and they'll be inspected in due course. Thanks, Alison. Stephen? Uh, mine is on a separate matter, Chair, if um, you have okay. to proceed. Okay, no. we'll hold you then and say if Seamus is coming in on the marking. Uh, I'm just flabbergasted by that response um, that we have to, if we, if we come across any of this, that we log it online. Um, I'm sure road service uh, management and uh, that aren't living in a bunker somewhere and they're out and about and almost every white line and uh, yellow line and roundabouts in this uh, in this council district needs to be upgraded and to come back with you know that if we see this that we should go online and log it it's just it's um, it's just having a laugh at us i think okay adam uh, Chair, if your permission, I think this might be an appropriate time for me second bit of AOB regarding DFI. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to propose that we write to, to Minister O'Dowd, the new infrastructure minister, minister regarding the A4 Southern Bypass. Uh, I would like to, in that letter, ask that Minister O'Dowd commits to the funding required to continue work on the Enniskillen Bypass and his budget decisions for the coming year. Funding was removed previously and other projects were prioritised, obviously in the context of a difficult funding situation uh, during uh, Minister O'Dowd's previous short spell in the role. Uh, I do think the Minister needs to, to reflect upon this previous decision and reconsider, because this bypass needs to be a top priority for the Minister, and people here deserve to know his position and need action on this matter. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Adam. I'm going to bring Alison in just. Yes, Chair, maybe just in, in the context of Councillor Gannon's proposal. So members may be aware that the Enniskillen Southern Relief Bypass is a scheme within the Mid-South West Growth Deal. 
um, and the funding allocation is from both our infrastructure pillar and then what was the new decade, new approach. We members will also be aware that DFI have been working really with all of the statutory and associated approvals specifically for the scheme because they need to know really by the middle of February, as I understand, for a procurement decision. So in that context and following uh, discussions in the growth deal, um, an allocation has been requested from our digital and innovation pillar to make up the match of the NDNA funding. So if uh, essentially it would allow the scheme to proceed, but with funding from the growth deal. So maybe if Councillor Gannon was minded, it would really be to encourage the minister to avail of that funding opportunity that the growth deal allows. My understanding is it's being very favourably received by within both the Department of Finance and uh, DFI officials, but also in the context of the lost, in inverted commas, NDNA money, that that could be reallocated if it's made available to the executive to another scheme in County Formula. Okay, yeah, happy enough there. Okay, I'm I'm going to bring Stephen in because I'm conscious that you're losing traction here with everybody. Is there anybody that is indicating at the moment wanting to speak on the road marking issue? Uh, Earl, okay. Go yeah, that and then I'm. Thank you very much, Chair. And obviously, following on from the director from or the letter from Director News to Daniel Healy and Daniel's response, uh, you would think that there was only one part of the district, and that's County Fermanagh. Uh, I mean, there's a largest district in Northern Ireland here, and almost a fair big part of it. And so it's, there are the same issues in the Oma part of the district as there is in County Fermanagh. Just making that point because he's come back with County Fermanagh or with referring to Fermanagh only. Um, just making that point, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, fair point. And Diana, you're on the same issue. Thank, thank you, Chair. Just, I want to, to raise a query on the response there. Um, it's really about the legalities, should there be a road accident, and it's proven that there were no road markings. I'm thinking of areas that I'm familiar with where, where cars regularly go over the centre of the road because it's a sweeping bend and there's absolutely no paint on it. So it's really, and, and, and we're a tourist area, we could have we could have tourists driving who are used to driving on a different side of the road. So again, I'd be, I, I propose we write and ask what the legalities are from the point of view of insurance for drivers if the road markings are not adequately clear. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thanks. Many roundabouts come to uh, mind uh, as well. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Okay, uh, John, you're on the same issue. No, you're on a different issue. Uh, Gavin, are you on the same issue? Marking, okay. Oh, no, it's just, just a second, Councillor Gannon's proposal after the input from the Chief Executive. All right, okay. Then are we all agreed then, just to get that one off the books, are we all agreed with uh, Adam's revised to uh, take account of the funding offer that is from the mid Southwest? Yeah, okay. That's good. And uh, I have a proposal from Diana, so I'm just conscious of that one. Uh, Stephen, you're in. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I'm conscious that I may need to get um, an answer, an update from um, Director News following this, uh, uh, if that update's not available at this time. But I just uh, want to raise it at this point, just under the ambit of environmental services. Um, Stephen, can you just talk into the mic a little bit more? I'm struggling. Apologies. Yep. Yeah. No. Um, um, I appreciate. Um, I, I may need to get an answer um, uh, following this, just because I didn't have the opportunity to raise this with director news uh, in advance of the meeting. But a number of months ago, um, just um, in the context of environmental services, I raised the issue of um, the mudslide at uh, Slaughter Glen following uh, torrential rainfall and uh, uh, significant flooding within the area. And at that point, um, there was a resolve that there would be. Uh, geotechnical inspections taking place in the autumn that would then be used as a basis to try and get uh, a solution to the damage that's been uh, wrought upon the area. And uh, I appreciate if um, potentially there's further information has to be uh, sought at this point, but uh, I suppose just at this point, um, uh, John, is there any uh, update just on that work? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stephen. John? Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I'm just um, checking back through my emails. I do recall uh, uh, Councillor Donnelly raising the, the matter back, it was October time, I think, that the, the issue had been raised. And as I think it was said at the time, there was to be further geotechnical inspections. I'll need to come back to you as to whether that work has been completed and what stage it's at, uh, just with an update. But that was, uh, sorry, I just, I'm, I'm 
checking through the emails as, as I'm talking to you here, and I, and I will come back to you. Okay, thanks, John. Roy? Thank you, Chair. I, Chair, I just want to second Councillor Armstrong's proposal there with regards to the the uh, the road markings, yeah. the legality of the insurance. And right to find that out. And Diana and Roy, are you happy enough to note and second the correspondence as well yep. that we received? Okay, members, are we yep. agreed to uh, right to seek the legalities? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moving on, anything else on seven or on eight? Nine. Dermot. Thanks, Chair. At the last council meeting, we discussed the the case that South Africa was bringing uh, against Israel for genocide to the International Court of Justice. And since that meeting, a preliminary hearing has taken place and, uh, and measures, preliminary measures have been mandated against Israel. Uh, I think it's hugely significant that the court has ruled that there is a plausible case of genocide uh, by Israel against the Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, I think to most of the world, this is an obvious case of genocide, but this ruling raises clear questions for the Western leaders that are continuing to arm and fund Israel, and serious questions for, for Rishi Sunak and Joe Biden and, and Keir Starmer. I want to congratulate the legal team who took on the case on behalf of the South African government, and in particular I want to name Blinia Lagrali, uh, the Irish citizen who represented the legal team and done Ireland very proud that day. Uh, I think it's absolutely shameful that the Irish government has continued to refuse to support the court case. Uh, and it's they, uh, there was a Sinn Féin brought a motion to the Dáil in the previous weeks and they voted that down. So I think the time for the Irish government is to step up now and to support that court case. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Dermot. Moving to page 10, 11. Thank you, Chair. Just at the top of page 11, um, I suppose firstly to note that we did, you, you led a, a cross-party delegation to meet with the Permanent Secretary uh, regarding the Struel Chair Education Campus, and that was in OMA as opposed to in, in Bangor Chair. Um, but I'd like to just at this point um, draw members' attention to correspondence. It's in the other folder. And it's from uh, Mr. Gormley, the principal of the Sacred Heart College, on behalf of each of the schools in the Struel Shared Educational Campus. And it's inviting all members to an engagement event. And it's really to promote the importance of the campus and really to mobilise effort around it. Just one change, Chair, to the uh, correspondence before you. The venue will now be Arvali School and Resource Centre, which, as many of you know, is on the Struel uh, campus itself. Mm -hmm. So just to commend that to you, and I know they're keen to have a cross-party elected member attendance. OK, thanks, Alison. Anne-Marie. Thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to, to welcome the invitation from schools to invite all elected members to attend. I think it's important that there's cross-party uh, support for this because it's such an important project. It's so important for the OMA district. Um, understanding too that obviously there's going to be elected reps in the catchment area from Mid Ulster Council and Derry and Strabane Council. So in light of that and also the importance of the project, I would like to propose that we forward the invitation Firstly, to the First and Deputy First Minister and the Minister for Education to ask them to come and support the event, and then to send it to all party leaders to ask them to ensure that their elected reps, be they councillors, MLAs, MPs, within the catchment area, that they will attend the event to show their support for such a valuable project. And I would ask the council officers as well if they can engage with the reps from the schools and also from the neighbouring councils to do whatever is necessary or whatever support that, that's needed to ensure that the event goes ahead as planned. And if there's any additional support required that they're willing to do that. So happy to propose that. Okay. And note, and note the correspondence. And note the correspondence. Thank you. Mark. Thank you, Chair. Happy to second uh, both of them items there for you. Thank you. Second vote. Okay. Are we all agreed there, members? Okay, thank you. Anything else on 10? Yes, Chair, just to note, um, 
Department for Infrastructure and just to advise members, we were notified today that the meeting proposed for Thursday the 29th of February with the Permanent Secretary has now been cancelled and the Department have asked or suggested that we may now wish to write to the Minister instead uh, if we wish to progress a meeting on this matter. Hmm. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I propose we write to the Minister and request the same meeting as we requested the Permanent Secretary. And will you note the correspondence, John? Thank you. And have I a seconder? Josephine, and you're noting the correspondence a second in that. Yeah, thank you. Seamus? Uh, yeah, ju just uh, when we're talking about the Minister, uh, uh, previously when the Minister was here, um, he had advised that uh, we seek clarification from the, I forget the, the, the name of the body, but the, the, the oversight, the independent oversight ones, and we have looked for a, a meeting with them uh, is there any word on that, uh, uh, Chief Executive, or do we maybe need to rewrite or reissue the invite? No, Chair, um, it, the utility regulator. So we have been following up with their office, and I did speak actually to the Chief Executive recently. It, it's just more a diary, trying to get something in. We will follow up, and I, I know he is keen to engage with members on this issue. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to 12. 13, 14, 15. Okay, Chair, just at the bottom of uh, page 15 to highlight uh, members, we've received correspondence from the Rural Housing Association in relation to the, the motion which was adopted on housing need, and it's in the other correspondence folder. Keith? I'm proposing old, but just with regard to housing, if you... Can I just come in yep. with here? As Councillor Martin, I'd actually apologise, he can't be here tonight, but coming on the back of the meetings that have been had with regard to the Housing Executive and the place shaping that, uh, obviously, with regard to Fermanagh, I believe in 2024, there's only plans to build nine additional houses within, within the Fermanagh part of the district. So uh, basically what the proposal was to invite Gronje Long, Chief Executive of the Housing Executive, and uh, Alma Newbury, the Director of Place Shaping, to a meeting of the, of the full, or a special meeting for the Council to address this, because obviously the, you know, going forward there is, there is a need out there, and with a, a proposing to build nine houses in the next year is obviously not, uh, not good enough. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Kate. Yeah. Have I got a seconder to note correspondence Eddie and to uh, second the, the invitation correspondence there? All agreed? Okay, thank you. And moving 15, 16. Chair, just in relation to item, sorry, item 16, um, or sorry, page 16, which is the response from the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero, so members will note this correspondence is dated the 14th of August. We have no evidence of this being received on the 14th of August. We've checked back in our system and we have also asked the department to forward us the details. They haven't done so. Um, so we certainly have no record of it previously being received, but in any case, that is the response. Okay. What, is there any... Seamus? Yeah, this is the, in relation to the energy payments. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I note in it that the, the say to uh, contact the provider uh, on it. So if they're saying that, I presume they're, that, that's basically saying that the payment still can be received, that it isn't entirely closed, that if uh, the providers I'm just reading between the lines in this here, and maybe we need to clarify it. So are we reading between the lines and saying that the providers has been provided this money from the government, but has never passed it on? Is that what we would take from that letter? Um, and uh, if so, can we write to the providers uh, to clarify that? That if people, uh, are they holding on to money that should have been uh, given out to their customers, because that's what that latter seems to state. Maybe I'm re reading it wrong. Maybe Chief Executive could clarify or, or confirm that that's... That seems fairly 
Yeah, Alison, just to... I think that's a fair assessment, Chair, and certainly we'd previously been advised there was an absolute around dates, and that cert this letter doesn't suggest that. So I think we can pursue the course of action. Yeah, yeah. can I just have a seconder there for that? Uh, Paul, thank you. Okay, members. And that concludes the minutes. So we're going to move on to item number five, and that's to confirm the minutes of the planning committee held on the 14th of December for accuracy. Page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, Stephen, accuracy, yep. Yeah, just an absence of the chair of the committee, I'll propose the minutes for accuracy. Uh, yeah. Okay, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And Stephen is proposing is Earl, thank you. Okay. I don't know, Yeah, I'm gonna have to get them to talk up. Um okay, matters arising, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and twenty one. Okay, thank you. So we're moving to point seven then. All right. Here, just uh, environmental services. That was a run through. I'm going to go to environmental, environmental services okay. now. Yep. Okay. So, environmental services committee on Wednesday, 10th of January, for accuracy. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe. You're proposing, thank you. And a seconder, uh, Paul, thank you. Okay, matters arising. Page one, two. All right. Thank you, Chair. Just in the recommendation on page two, um, there's a reference there to Vera Swifts. And uh, I would like to maybe just to ask the relevant director, you know, the import of that recommendation. Speak, it's against the backdrop of myself and John, when I was chair of the council, having met representatives of the Barra Swifts Club. So I just want to keep up to date with what the import, the meaning of this is, this recommendation, with effect, with effect, with regard to Barra Swifts and what they want, what they're getting, um, by way of necessary sport and provision in, in the area? Yes, <clears throat> Chair, as the, uh, as the recommendation says, when we met Bear Swifts, they were looking for us to surrender the sublease, um, uh, uh, the leases with the private landowner, so that they could actually get into leasing or, or purchasing the property directly themselves. So this recommendation is actually to take forward that, that proposal that we did when we met with them. Yeah, thanks, John. Shirley? Sorry, I just wanted to declare an interest. Okay. In Barra Swifts. In, in Barra Swifts. Okay, that's lovely. Cheers, thank you. Okay, moving on from page two to three, four, Mark. Thank you, Chair, and it's in relation to 
5.2, the annual waste, manage, waste management statistics. And I mean, Chair, I would make the point, I can't be the only councillor. I know I'm not the only councillor because it's often raised amongst party colleagues of mine in terms of the ongoing disruption to waste management, parts of waste management services in terms of the opening times or the disruption to the opening times of recycling centres, but also the, what seems or strikes me as very significant disruption to the collection of certain bins on an increasing number of routes. And whilst I appreciate looking at it, it seems predominantly, predominantly to be the brown bins, the food caddy bins. I also notice sometimes blue bins are being impacted. And I can only imagine, luckily enough, on my road, on my route, we haven't been impacted recently. But if you have a brown bin, a small food caddy filled for a fortnight, and if you leave it out in good faith, hoping or expecting the council to collect it the following morning, and it's not, and then you see a notification or something pop up on Facebook or wherever that says, don't worry, we'll collect it in another fortnight, and we're sorry, I think, well, I know that's causing huge, huge disruption, because I hear it, lots of colleagues here hear it, and my fear is, Chair, at this stage, it's going on so much and it's happening so often that I would worry about what those households are doing out of often through no choice of their own. Quite often, I suspect more and more households will be putting that brown, that brown food carry waste directly into the green bin or the, the waste bin. So that then has a huge financial impact on the council in terms of landfill and all the costs associated with that. I mean, Chair, I've raised it before with officials regularly, and to be fair to the officials, they always come back very quickly. But in terms of this council's stance on it, I think we are, on the, we are in the wrong place because it has, it has been happening for so long, it's clear that the solution that we currently have in terms of we're relying on staff goodwill and we're relying on a casual list of staff, it isn't working. And I suspect, and I know it, I wasn't on the council when the decision was taken, so I'm not, I wasn't here whenever it worked well, but I get the sense that it's the, that strict prohibition on overtime that is having a detrimental impact to the service because few things are certain in life as staff will get sick and staff will always want to take the annual leave they're contractually entitled to. But I get the sense that when someone phones in sick and there's no cover and because there's no overtime or when someone takes um, or requires a few days leave or takes a Saturday off, that will have a big impact on that service. So quite often recycling centres are closing just like that, causing huge disruption to those areas. And even I raised the issue again about Drummy. I know Drummy is opening every day, but it is having its hours curtailed and that is having a huge impact. And even when I look, look at the likes of Balik, Garson, Kinoli, they're very rural areas. And it might be easy to say travel into Enskill, but it's not really realistically that easy. So Chair, I, I'm, I, I don't mean to dwell on it. And there's just one other point I'd like to raise, Chair, and I'll not get into the, the specifics because I'm sure there'll be an investigation, or I know there's an investigation underway, but in terms of the reports in the media recently of, and I'll not get into the details of it, but in terms of that, I do feel as councillors, we weren't particularly well served in terms of the council's initial response, because whenever I read it, I think from memory it said, this was, this was Wednesday, that it would take X number of days to respond. I, I feel the council didn't respond until well into the following week, and that could have easily been dealt with in a much better way. Okay. Right. I'm going to take a couple more here. Anne? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, and I'll um, just make a comment or two about this as well. Yeah, it has been a bit of a problem, and we have brought it up in the Regeneration uh, Environment Service meeting. Sorry, I see Councillor Ellett there. Come, trying to come in there as well. Myself and him was talking about it at a meeting way back there. And um, well, we weren't too bad around Garrison. It was closed once or twice where it shouldn't have had, but I know other areas were affected um, a lot. But it's uh, the small brown building seems to be the problem. And it's kind of strange when you have the two bins out, they're lifting up the, the blue bin, but not the, the, wee, the wee brown bin. Is it, um, is there two different trucks coming out lifting them? Or is it that, the, that the, there's not enough staff on the lorry at the time when they're lifting them? That's more, I was just wondering. Yeah. Sorry. My attention was drawn otherwise, and I, I do apologise. John. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, a couple of things, as a uh, number of members have referred to, the uh, issue of missed bins has been uh, discussed on uh, 
over the recent months in environmental services, and I appreciate that is the, the primary uh, home for that. The mother has been raised under under matters arising from the last set of environmental services. Uh, I have uh, responded uh, to members and uh, provided an update uh, on the, I suppose, the reasons behind it. As we've said uh, in our public media posts, it's due to operational uh, reasons and uh, obviously respecting uh, our staff. You know, we don't go into the details uh, of, of those operational reasons, but it's, it is Miss uh, Caddy's in particular due to operational reasons. Uh, on the, the specific questions around uh, the incidence of it, uh, it hasn't increased uh, from this time last year. Uh, we are delivering council services within the budgets that have been approved uh, by members last February. Uh, that's something that uh, is very important to us in terms of uh, ensuring there's value for money uh, around that service. Uh, on the, the specific question about the, uh, the, the vehicle, uh, it's a, a single lorry that would go out to lift uh, the blue in the Cali. Uh, there are the risk assessment for that process requires a driver and two lifters. Uh, in the event uh, that we don't have a, a full complement of crews, then we, we drop bins and we drop a container in line with the council's agreed contingency plan. And that's the, I suppose, the update that we have provided the members previously in environmental services, and that continues to be the, the case. Okay, thanks, John. Seamus? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I suppose the background to this is, um, well, first of all, I hope that uh, one of the previous councillors that, uh, that spoke, and I am taking it in goodwill that he, he wasn't suggesting this, and I hope this impression wouldn't come from the council, that we are in any way suggesting that workers are deliberately calling in sick uh, if they weren't. So just to make that clear, uh, I don't think any of us are suggesting that. Um, the other thing is, it seems to be if if one of the of the team is absent, it leaves that um, the small bin isn't lifted because it has to be manually lifted into the truck. So uh, uh, that seems to be the problem in that. And I suppose the problem in that goes back to a decision we made in this chamber a number of years ago uh, when uh, in my, and I've said it before, uh, we discriminated against rural people because we give large brown bins to uh, the urban population. We give the small, we give the small um, uh, food bins, the, the weak caddy bins to the rural population. And I suspect that the large bins are being collected all of the time, the large brown bins, because they click onto the lorry and empty themselves automatically as long as they're pushed into place. Uh, so it's the small bin that has to be lifted is the problem. And that stems from the fact that rural and urban uh, was treated differently when the, that was being roll, rolled out. So I'm just throwing that, that out there that that's what I think that is part of the problem. Once you start treating residents of uh, the council area uh, differently because of where they live, eventually there will be problems that will happen. And uh, uh, in my opinion, that's what's happening. Okay. Thanks, Seamus. Adam? Thank you, Chair. And just to come in on, on this issue, um, it, it does seem to be, uh, obviously, the director has outlined that it's not increased in frequency from this time last year, but it, it feels like it has increased in frequency in recent weeks compared to previous months. Um, because for quite a while, we had kind of got a bit more of a handling on it and had a bit more of a grip of the situation, or maybe we were just fortunate um, with, with staffing matters. But I do think uh, it's unac unacceptable to the public um, that, we, that we have this position. Uh, for most people in this district, our main service, and for some, the perception is that our only service is collecting the waste. And we, we are letting many people down it. I do think, uh, from speaking to people, a lot of people are just giving up on uh, especially the composting. And some are starting to give up on, on some of the recycling as well, because they're just like, it's not being collected. Uh, and, I'd, and in particular, in the rural areas, as Councillor Green has, has pointed out, uh, the small caddies are an issue because of size, as, as you're probably well aware, Chair. And 
uh, Councillor Owens has, has outlined that there, there is additional costs when our recycling percentages drop, uh, and we need to take that into consideration when we're coming to, to budgetary decisions. Surely there must be a crossover point where if the recycling figures drop, the extra charges would far out, out, outweigh and exceed the costs of additional staff or overtime. Um, I do think this is something that, that we need to review uh, in, the, in the very near future and potentially consider a change in, in policy on it to make sure it's covered. Obviously, we'd have to consider uh, every aspect of that in a proper report, Chair. And even on, on Councillor Green's point on the, on the difference, now, due to obviously cost pressures at the moment, we wouldn't be doing it uh, in the next year, I would imagine. But I do think there'd be worthwhile uh, scope in, in the next in this term to reviewing the position of the caddies versus the 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 big and the large bins. I think there there is there is an issue there, and many times it's those in the rural areas who do need the the large bins as well. Um, I'll leave it at that, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Keith. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Well, as Councillor Felix said over the, over the chamber, there it's something that an environmental services that has been raised on numerous and numerous occasions. Um, obviously, there the last couple of months that it seemed to ease off a wee bit, but I uh, say again, we're back to uh, the the missed uh, caddies being lifted, and as I. As was said at, at previous environmental services meeting, it's it's not it's not good enough. You know, as Councillor Gallon said, there it's one service that uh, a lot of the ratepayers believe it's the only thing they get. And if we can't lift the bins, there's you know there's something there's something badly wrong. So I do believe it need it needs to be looked at again. And I understand with regard to overtime and that. And but we need to be able to lift the bins. I, I think it's totally unacceptable that uh, people, and as it has been said here as well, the people are stopping recycling. There's no doubt about that, and uh, it will it will have an effect at some stage. We spent years trying to encourage people to recycle, and now when when things is in place to do it, we can't even lift the bins, and it's it's not good enough, and uh, it does need to be looked at again, and uh, so. I probably would propose in the back of this that uh, a report would be brought back to environmental services with regards to how we uh, how we can change that uh, that the people you know the residents of the district are getting their bins lifted and uh, whether something has to come back to full council to be changed. But I do believe it's, it's got to the stage now where it is unacceptable. We're becoming a laughing a laughing stock. You know, all you have to see is all the laughing emoji, emojis on Facebook. You know, people people you know. It just it's just laughable at the minute, but we need to be able to lift the bins for the people. So uh, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. John. Thank you, Chair. Fortunately, in my small local area, we've had quite a few deaths over Christmas, so been attending funerals and wakes. And uh, when you're in a room, you're trapped, and you, you, you generally get to hear. And the general topic of conversation was the people in my locality weren't going to use their brown bins anymore because they're never emptied. Now, they're not never emptied, but they're not emptied quite regularly. So as an experiment last Monday morning, I thought I'd see how many people left their brown bins out. And I'm driving Manu Road, Kiladies Road, through Lisnarek, and out of Lisnarek Road to almost to Lisnarek to the town boundary. Counted almost 100 blue bins and eight brown caddies. So that's the effect that this is having. People are stopping to use it. And after educating them to use the brown bins, they're just saying they're not going to. And how, how do we change that attitude if we do or manage to provide the service again? And it's something we have to fundamentally, we've, I don't know, I don't know the answers and I know that the staff are trying hard to get a way of solving it, but we're going to have to come up with something fairly quickly because people are starting to lose patience with us. Yeah, thanks, John. Diana? Chair, thank you. Yes, uh, it's a conversation we've had many times and it seems like a circular conversation. Um, my proposal is, Chair, that we, we do owe the ratepayers communication on this matter. We've talked about it. It's raised um, person to person. For example, as jo John has alluded to, Kilides, which is near where I live, and some of the residents have been ringing me saying the bins, the blue cad brown caddies were not lifted yesterday, well, on Monday. And then on social media, there was a message saying they'd be lifted today, which is very welcome, but a lot of those people didn't see it. 
So I think the communication is vital that um, my proposal would be a communication is sent out district wide to, to empathize it with people having these, to explain the kinds of situation um, that it, it will be looked at as a, it's been proposed to be actually raised as an issue to be investigated long, for a long term solution and that we communicate the, the actions a resident must take if their bin isn't lifted, that they get the, the, they get the information they require if there is a secondary lift the following day. I think that's important. I think people were caught off the hop up, um, today. They didn't know, and they would have put them out had they known. So thanks, Chair. OK. And our last speaker is Eddie. Thanks, Chair. Um, just to echo the other councillors so far, you know, it, it's it's quite high on the agenda for a lot of people's email inboxes, um, various people, and it's it's people are contacting us not because they've lost, they've missed it for the first time or the second time. It's it's repeating for a number of people, and uh, and yes, they are they are making the point that you know if you're if you're a family of four and you've got a small caddy as it is, <clears throat> and then you miss that one, you know, it, it's it's not even a viable option. To fill that caddy because it will be completely overfilled um and and this time of year when it's a bit colder perhaps it's not the end of the world but when it gets to the summer and the heat starts you know you're, you're you're really having a serious problem could i ask if we could possibly get some some figures as to what uh what the estimates are for for recycling and and if possible for the the, the brown waste as well to see if we have seen any reduction uh in the in the use of, of, of both of those um, and subsequently have we seen any increase in the amount going to landfill as a result of that because it's going to go somewhere um, we're, we're at a point where the service has has been reflected across the, the chamber tonight is at a point where people are starting to lose faith in, in the reliability of it um, I understand the council's position uh, regarding regarding uh, everything in the background of that, but we are at a point now where uh, I feel we need to review uh, and to see what we can do to ensure the reliability of uh, of service throughout throughout the year. Okay, right. Victor, I'm just letting in because you got a second. Second, Councillor Armstrong's proposal. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to ask Alison to. Clarify a few bits and pieces here as we. No, Chair, it, it was really just, and I know the Director is intending to bring a report on this matter, which deals with a number of the, the queries that members have raised. And all I was going to suggest, Chair, maybe if Councillor Roof was, or rather Councillor Elliot was content, that the various data requests that Councillor Roof has also suggested we could incorporate that in and, and bring that detail through. I think, Chair, and members will also be aware from various reports that have come to um, around the human resource aspects of this because they are pertinent to this and they're uh, relevant, not relevant, that I would raise them in open business, but happy to give you an update uh, later in the meeting as to how those matters are progressing. But um, I, I do fully appreciate the, the frustrations that members are feeling, the anger of the local community, uh, but I also do know the team is working extremely hard to respond diligently and professionally to the various requests that come in um, and we will bring that composite report. Obviously, it'll be to the March meeting uh, because we'll be waiting for some of the data, but we, we can ensure that that's uh, fully encompassing. Uh, I also know, Chair, that it, it's John's intention uh, in the context of even Councillor Green's comments about the, the, the caddy and the different models. Uh, we are expecting and maybe things will be expedited now with the new minister, quite significant changes to the waste collection policy in Northern Ireland, which will have a direct impact on our service, what we do and how and uh, how we actually collect waste and the frequency of it as well. Um, and it certainly is part of that paper coming forward. I know it's uh, John's desire that we would establish a working group of members to really work through the nuts and bolts of all of this with you. Uh, you certainly know uh, your constituents requirements and needs but this is it's technical it's expensive and it is not straightforward okay members and Aaron. very quickly chair uh, thanks for letting me in i know councillor elliot had proposed made a proposal i'm prepared to second that the, the other proposals that have been made and seconded can be incorporated if everybody's agreeable with it i think we're all agreed across the chamber on these matters so i think yeah. a lot of that can be incorporated 
Yeah. So if Keith and and Eddie are are content that all of that information would be included, can we take it that that will be incorporated there? That's fair enough. And Diana's uh, specific um, uh, proposal to write uh, out to people and give them the the information. Uh, Roy will second that. Victor, Victor seconded that. Okay, so all agreed on that? Okay, so then that substantive report will come back in March to us there. Um, we'll see where we go. Okay, anything else on page five? And six. Okay. Going to move on to the Regeneration Community Committee, and that was held on the 16th of January. So, for accuracy, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay. And Mark is going to propose. Happy to propose the minutes, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. And the second to Diana. Thank you. And on matters rising, page one, two, three, four. Seamus. Uh, thank you, Chair. It was just something that came up in uh, in this discussion around uh, dark skies and that um, I had uh, dissented from this decision because uh, it uh, said that the, the report suggested that there wasn't much interest from the Slave Bay re region that there hadn't been and I uh, disputed that as that there was a lot, an awful lot of discussion around it. In fact, I believe it was the Clonus Erne, or Bally Bay Clonus Erne East group that first mentioned the dark skies uh, initially. Uh, but then, um, in the course of that and in the course of another report uh, around the lighting in Belcoo, um, we were told that one of the reasons why there could be no lighting but around the walkway in Belcoo was because it would... Um, you couldn't put that light, light around the walkway because of the dark skies application. And uh, so then my question was, uh, so does that rule out all development? Because if you build a development of houses, there would obviously be street lighting and different things. So um, does an application to dark skies basically end any development in around the likes of Belcoo? And... Uh, at this stage, then, if that was the case, I'm actually quite glad that Slee Bay uh, uh, was excluded from it because uh, if, and I'm not sure whether people around uh, Belcoo and that realise that that is what's been put forward, that uh, why the path isn't being lit up and then to extend that, uh, there'd be little or no development allowed with the dark skies uh, application. Okay, Shamus. Debbie? Um, thank you, Chair. Just um, on 4.5, um, I'm delighted to see this project is moving forward for the Brookborough Community Group. Um, and in a just some, I just want to like to ask a similar question and look for an update on the land or the field in Sycamore Drive in Cavanagh that the council are looking to work with the local community with. I understand that the housing executive has um, agreed or cleared an updated lease agreement from last year. Um, and the community association have spoken to the housing executive and they've confirmed that that is the case. However, they've heard nothing from the council and have asked me um, to ask for an update, please. Chair, I was just going to suggest, certainly, and I'm aware I've also been copied in previously in correspondence on this, Councillor Coyle, I know we have the estates report tomorrow evening. If if we could check just with our property manager before the meeting tomorrow evening and report back to, okay. to you then, if that's okay. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Okay. And 
Just go, the same page, but I can. I can Aye, go, one, no, go on ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry, Chair, it was just, and I know other members, it was just more on a, I have communicated this with, with members, but just to note that tomorrow's Health and Social Care Services Subcommittee meeting uh, has been cancelled at the request of the Trust, and that's because now, obviously, with the appointment of the Minister, they're keen to take a ministerial views and briefing on wider issues relating to the district. So a revised date of the 12th of March uh, has been proposed, and we're, we're trying to get it expedited, uh, but that seems to be the next available date. And I know the Chair, Councillor Coyle, was keen that the Trust representatives will be in person for that meeting, and that's their intention. So sorry, just to note. Just that's, a, all. that's an update, yeah. Okay, Adam. Thank you, Chair. I believe Councillor Green kind of segued into the cottage lawn. I know it's page five. Would you rather wait or would you? No, go with the ahead. Other go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. So we had a discussion in this meeting regarding policy uh, and on investigation after the meeting and with when policies were sent to me, I discovered that all, well, in, in terms of our um, our business cases uh, policy and options appraisal, uh, our online policy, our publicly available policy is, is badly out of date. It's over two years out of date. Uh, hence why there was confusion during the meeting. Uh, and I was quoting the publicly available policy, policy that's hyperlinked to our constitution, uh, yet it wasn't updated. So firstly, I'd just like to, to propose um, that we review all our publicly published policies online to make sure they're up to date and that what we what we have is um, a kind of biannual, twice at a minimum, twice a year check, of going through all the policies and hyperlinks on the constitution to ensure that's up to date to prevent any confusion. I think the public should should know our policies and not be that significantly out of date. Secondly, chair, as we had the discussion, it was very clear that that some of the councillors, myself included, really disagreed with the decision. And the business case form, in this case the short form, um, it wouldn't it wasn't attached, and it wouldn't normally be attached. So I would like to, to propose a change to how these reports are presented in future, and that's that the business case reports uh, and forms are attached, so we can see all the information, all the reasoning, and, and come to a decision from that. I think it's very important we have the full picture. I'm aware from chatting to the chief executive though that they may have to be confidential. Uh, Published. And if that's the case, that's the case. But I think we need to know the full reasoning behind, because otherwise we're a wee bit in the dark, and it leads to, to it leads to uh, some some disagreements potentially and misunderstandings. Uh, and finally, chair, as it came from that meeting, is we we had a situation where council has massively disagreed with the options with the business case, uh, and as a result, the options appraisal policy, chair. So I would like to propose um, that we uh, review our options appraisal policy. Uh, and I was informed by the chief executive this could be complete by our March meetings. And I, I would stress the, the importance of speed in this, given how long people in Belcoo have waited for a final decision on these lights. I think it's, it's vital this policy is, is adopted, that we can make a decision on this. What I would like to see in said policy is that where a business case form... Sorry, Adam. Guys, honestly, the acoustics in here is so bad. Unless we get sort of fair silence there. And Adam is one, can I remind people, Adam, one of our better speakers into mics. So it's really, really hard up here to hear. And if we're going to try and get the gist of what uh, is going on, we've got to try and keep the conversations down. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, and sorry, as I was as I was saying, that any case where a business case form is completed, either short or long form, as in line with the policy, that this needs to be uh, produced and officers report this to committee for the committee to decide, rather than being delegated to officers for those two occasions. It would be a slight change in the policy. Furthermore, I would like to see scope be built into the policy, that if members disagree with a recommendation and that they can provide sound logic and can demonstrate that it meets the criteria by, by their own reasoning, uh, that we can overturn a recommendation from officers for, for projects like this. Um, I would like to see this included in the review. 
I think that can be achieved in a similar way to how the planning committee can deviate from planning officers' recommendations. And as part of that proposal, that uh, and if a new policy is adopted yeah. with those, that the required training is provided as soon as possible. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'm I'm going to uh, bring Alison in, but my feeling here, Adam, is that is a wealth of of proposal there to be chucking in on the hop. That really needs to be taken to a committee and allow people time and space and and opportunity to go through what your proposals. Not disagreeing, but I'm just saying that's too much to pop in here. <laughs> A feel of what it was a detailed feel of where you want to go. Um, so, Alison. Uh, okay. So, so chair, maybe just my my understanding of what Councillor Gannon is is proposed in the first instance. Um, they and he's quite correct in terms of the documentation which was on the website and was out of date. So, practical consideration that we would review that information on a biannual basis and ensure it's current and up to date. That uh, going forward. The, ref the reports and forms associated with the business case assessment would be appended to the report. On occasion, some of that may, in a similar way, tenders would be included on the confidential section of decision time, that, but the information would be available for members' information. That we would then have a review of the options appraisal policy, and within that review, consideration is given to the if members deviate, you know, have a, a different view in terms of the officer recommendation that there is scope for that to be overturned based on sound reasoning. Um, the, the only maybe comment so and that that would be progressed and expedited and we would we would uh, schedule that for March reporting. Um, uh, this is something we can include in the review chair. Uh, the, the only comment I would just or suggestion I would make it's quite on you like generally the short form business case which is below a hundred thousand pounds excuse me, our routine items of expenditure that the council typically agrees with. I think it would probably be um, a delay just to allow everything to have to go for approval. And it may be just for matters similar to planning, call in almost, or matters that there may be a differing opinion that we would give that flexibility. But I think that's something we can work through on the policy basis. But as, I suppose the, the core is that where members fundamentally disagree with a proposed course of action uh, to provide room within the policy that also meets our wider financial governance, that that, that, that difference can be reflected. So yeah. That's my yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Anne-Marie, are you coming in on the same vein or? No. Oh, okay, you're not coming in. What I want to do is get this tidied off. So just uh, do that. So can I have a second or then? Uh, for Adam's proposal that this is Gavin Seknan, that this is reviewed, a lot of good suggestions there, and that this is taken back then through in March, and that will give you. Are we all agreed there, members? Yep. Oh. Yeah, Gavin. And uh, Anne Marie. Um, yes, Chair, thanks for letting me in. Um, as a Metro councillor and as a rural councillor, I'm very mindful of um, villages. And um, also want to support Bell Q just um, for their initiative of continuing to looking for the uh, lights for their walkway. It was just something I want to bring forward through the council, through yourself, Alison, and your officers. Um, there has been an issue in Gorchin, um, poorly lit area. Now, it is an area and there is part of the land which is in council land. I think there's a couple of lighting columns on it. Um, it leads to a house estate. It leads along on Kalu, um, the, uh, the the community hub, the hall, um, over to the GA pitch and out onto the main road. So that is totally unlit. Um, can you give me an update of um, why the columns aren't lit? Will there be a, 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 well, I know they have full support from the GA pitch and from the Colognes who stand there for getting additional lighting in there because it's a woeful place. It's supposed to be a place to encourage walkers and everything else. And, but it's, it's, it's a danger, it's a sort of a dangerous area because of the lay of the land, ups and downs and everything else. So I think they want to progress with lighting as well in that area. That's my proposal. Chair, Councillor Fitzgerald's content, I know exactly the area and it's something yeah. we investigated before. I, I don't have the information this evening, but I'd come back quickly on yeah. that if, if that's okay, Chair. We could report then formally to members as well when Thank I have that. Much. Thank you. Happy enough there, Anne-Marie, yep. Thank you. Okay, John. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to do a quick follow-up from some of the points Councillor Green raised about dark sky status. And I'm on the Caulfield Lakelands Geopark, and my understanding was there are, there, there are about six different status, statuses of dark skies. There's communities, parks, reserves, sanctuaries. Some of them are far more onerous on local areas than others. And my understanding was the, the, the type of status that the Coca Lakelands are looking for, for is one that wouldn't be restrictive to especially towns and villas. It's looking for development and stuff. So I'd just be worried that maybe some officer may have give the council a bit, a bit of a wrong stay there. You know. Just make an initial comment, sorry, Chair, and I'll, I'll defer to John. No, my understanding is, as per the report, we're going for reservation uh, status, which allows for some flexibility. But the general principle is that, so the baseline of lighting that exists is part of that, and you would be actively discouraged from new lighting. But I'll defer to John. Yeah. Yes, Chair. Uh, I think I stated at, at uh, the RNC meeting that if we were to have future lighting, we would have to go back to the Dark Skies Institute in order to see if we still complied with the reserve status that we were going for. And I think that is the basis of it. That uh, and you member points out absolutely correctly. I think there are five designations of Dark Skies and all depending on the light that was in the vicinity of that dark skies designation would determine the type of designation that you would get and the reserve i think is the third uh, is the third level and we would have to go back and get accreditation to see is it still relevant they may push us down into the fourth or the fifth element with, with future lighting okay thanks john john yeah, uh, something similar to the understanding I had as well. But also, the, some of the de designations too, it, it talks about specific areas. So I was just wondering that if the, the, we're going for reserve, would that be including the villages within the area? Yeah, Chair, there, there are various different designations. And, and yes, certainly the fact that we're not going for a dark skies park yeah, and that was one of the one of the the facts coming out from the institute uh, of which we applied for firstly, uh, that because of the vicinity of Belcou or or the surrounding areas, that we that the most they encouraged us to go for the reserve. If lighting were to increase, though, in light of of future developments or whatever, we would have to go to the institute again and get. To, to seek their advice on the accreditation as to which level of accreditation we, we would wish to have. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Andy? Yes, thank you, Chair, and th thanks, um, John Boyle, for that um, answer there. For, I was just coming in on that as well, and um, Councillor Feely there had asked the question, so I was kind of, it's kind of worrying that a bit, the dark skies. But I just want to mention something here when I, when I am talking, because um, Councillor Gannon mentioned earlier on how long this has been going on. Myself and Elaine's working on it at the minute, and of course, Councillor Gannon as well. And before, and the previous mandate, myself and Councillor McCaffrey and Councillor Gannon, it goes as far back as Councillor Doherty and in the Fermanagh, Fermanagh Council of Fourth Manor, Oman Janet, Councillor Stephen Hoggart, it has been welcoming these lights in Belgium, so it's gone on far too long. And hopefully, we'll get some kind of an answer, whatever the answer will be shortly. And I'm, I've just started working on the lights in another area at the minute, so I hope it's not going to go on as long as this. And I just want to make that comment. Okay, uh, Roshan. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to um, second Anne Marie's proposal there for the lights of Gorton. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Roshan. Are we all happy enough with that, members? Just uh, Anne Marie's proposal, second by Roshan there. Yep, okay. And I'm just going to ask Alison. Chair, no, thank you. I think maybe just even based on a couple of just comments, one point of clarification. So notwithstanding the proposal, which members have agreed around the review of the policy, the, the uh, minute which has been adopted recommends the noting of the business case, the outcome of the business case on cottage lawn be deferred to the February meeting. So we will be including that within the report. It's not 
uh, ignoring this evening's debate so as, so it doesn't come as a surprise. But the second point here, I think maybe is important to note, there have been a number of update reports on cottage lawn over the years and quite a bit of work been done. But just in light of even more recent comments, I think it's probably important for you to be aware in the context of wider policy consideration, the council does not have a policy on lighting uh, external paths or open spaces. So that may be something in due course that you would wish to consider, but just to be aware that, that is, we do not have a policy position on that. Okay, we're moving on. So nothing else on five, six, seven, eight. Seamus? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this is Ryan Agriculture Liaison. Uh, group and uh, I had asked for uh, to come in on any other business but I thought maybe this would be uh, a relevant point to come in on this. Um, with the recent appointment of uh, Minister Andrew Muir, Muir uh, to DERA, uh, I have been inundated with uh, uh, farms, family farms ringing me people really worried about uh, this development. Um, the Alliance Party uh, position on, on agriculture uh, isn't far away from the Green Party position on it. Uh, I was reading their manifesto, um, the sad person that I am, and one of the things they were saying was that, you know, all farms should uh, 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 by electric tractors. Now, if we are in the real world and the real people out in rural areas, that type of thing might be funny to some, but it's certainly not funny to family far farms where people maybe has 10 cows and are someone suggesting about buying an electric tractor at £200,000. Uh, so this is the type of stuff that farmers are frightened of, are, are really uh, uh, can't believe that uh, the type of policies that's coming in, if we look right across Europe, um, far, farmers are out protesting on the streets, uh, even across the border they're out doing it. And I, just the way farming is going in the north, I can, I can see the same things happening here. So what I am proposing is that we write to the new minister uh, and we ask him for an urgent meeting, uh, uh, an in-person meeting with uh, councillors, uh, either through the uh, Agriculture Liaison Group or through the full council to go over these policies uh, that, that uh, has been proposed uh, with them and to either allay farmers fears or to um, to let farmers realize what's coming down the road at them and uh, so i am proposing that we write and look for an origin meeting with the new minister okay thanks Seamus. Anthony. yeah th thank you chair likewise i've been chatting with a lot of farmers since saturday when this was announced so well um i like to agree with Seamus there and, and propose second his proposal Okay, thanks, Anthony. Members, are we agreed? Yeah, I appreciate Diane's coming in there. Uh, Diana? Chair, thank you. Yes, if, if it's any reassurance to Councillor Green, I'd like to, to welcome that um, Tom Elliott, MLA, has been appointed as chair of the Rural of, of DERA Committee. And uh, as a Fermanagh farmer, he, he certainly knows the ins and outs of farming. If that's any reassurance, um, I'd like to welcome that and congratulate him. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, he's well placed now to advocate there. Uh, Stephen? Well, thank you, Chair, and uh, take on board what Councillor Green is saying. I'm very glad that he's been improving his reading materials, that he's reading the Alliance Party Manifesto. But I'll say this, Sinn Féin had three opportunities to pick the DERA portfolio during the DAHOM process, and at no stage did they make that decision. So whenever we st step up to the plate, we will be making sure that we do provide leadership on the full remit of the department, including the agricultural aspect. It is long past time that we got past 
this idea that agriculture and the environment has to be at war with each other whenever there has to be a partnership approach that recognises the valuable role the farmers play as stewards of the land and the role that they have to play in terms of food production, but also in terms of making sure that we protect the land and fight climate change going into the future. So I welcome the appointment of Minister Muir. I have no doubt that he will make a very valuable contribution in the context of this mandate. And I have no issue whatsoever with uh, issuing that invitation. I look forward to uh, further engagement in the future. Yep, no, it all sounds very good. So we look forward to that. Okay, anything else on it? Nine, 10, and 11. Okay, thank you. Going to move on to Policy and Resources Committee. And that meeting was held on the 17th of January. And for accuracy, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And Stephen, you're going to propose. Thank you. And the seconder, uh, Josephine. Thank you. Matters rising. Page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay. Thank you, members. And we're moving to point thirteen now. So that's to consider delegation of council powers to the following committee in February, and that's Policy and Resources Committee to consider a report on draft response to the Department of Health consultation on the strategic framework to prevent the harm caused by obesity and improve diets and levels of physical activity. Josephine proposed. Thank you. And Eddie, you're seconded. Thank you. Adam. Thank you, Chair. Related to this, uh, just to inquire around the Regional Obesity Management Service consultation, if we haven't responded to it. Um, I believe the closing date for uh, response is about the 14th of this, this month, so it is quite close. I don't know if we have responded to it, uh, but if we haven't, could I ask that we do respond to it and highlight the need to locate bariatric surgery in SWA and the benefits that could bring to restoring emergency general surgery in the area? Thank you, Chair. Okay. Yeah, we'll check that. That's, we'll check that. Okay. And I had that proposed and seconded for the uh, uh, Council Powers to Policy and Resources. Yeah. Uh, are we all agreed on that? And can I just have a seconder for Adam's proposing, Bernard, in case we haven't, and that way. Are we all agreed there? I will progress that then. Okay, so we're moving to point 14, correspondence, and that's the uh, no correspondence from the 11th of January uh, from the Department of Agriculture. Chair, this was in, in it's, I suppose, our letter of the 6th of October, which was follow-up correspondence in relation to a previous uh, motion adop ad adopted by the Council, so this is the Permanent Secretary's response to that. Okay. Mark? Thank you, Chair. Happy to note the correspondence. And Chair, I'd like to make a proposal that we write back to, again, Minister Muir, just in terms of, because I'm conscious that he is just through the door and bovine TB may not be an area or policy area that he has a great deal of experience or focus on. So I think things are so bad within the county and particularly within the Enniskill and Veterinary Office area now in relation to bovine TB that it would be worthwhile immediately bring it to the attention of the minister so i'd propose i know we've written previously but that was officials that read the reply or read the letter and then responded through that reply okay. so i think it's worthwhile bringing forward to the minister again thank you okay john yeah i'd like to second that and you're happy to second happy to note the, note the, the, yeah. okay are we happy enough with that members okay thank you and moving on to our second piece of correspondence then so, Chair, this is the response from DFI in relation to the Council's challenge, really, about the failure to release information regarding the All Island Strategic Rail Review. They have worked this through their processes and are satisfied that uh, the decision to withhold information was appropriate for the reasons set out in the previous correspondence. And the, the final option available now to the Council is detailed on, really, the last page of the letter before the Annex, which is that we would make an appeal to the Information Commissioner's Office. Okay. Adam. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I suppose, uh, agree to disagree with the department on whether they should give us the information or not. Look, we've kind of been, been round in, in circles on this one. They're just not giving it to us. Uh, so firstly, I, I propose to note this uh, piece of um, correspondence, but I would like to, on the back of it, now that we have a minister, I think we can maybe make some headway that isn't chasing departments for information, just to propose that we write to Minister O'Dowd to ask what steps he will take uh, in, in engaging with his counterpart in the South to ensure that Fermanagh is included in the final All-Ireland year. Okay, thanks Adam. I have a seconder. Bernard, uh, are we all agreed, members? Okay, and Bernard, you're happy to second the noting. Okay, thank you. Moving on to third piece. Mr. Chair, this is a notification of the Royal Irish Concert, well, sorry, the Army Benevolent Fund the anniversary of the Royal Irish Concert at the Waterfront Hall on the 8th of April, forwarding for information and uh, really for members' own consideration, Chair, it, it wouldn't uh, comply with our charity's policy. Okay. Can I propose and second to note? Diana, thank you. And Roy, thank you. Moving on to our next piece of correspondence. Yes, Chair, so this is a, a designation of the first Sunday in March, which is due to be a UK-wide day of reflection to remember those who died during the COVID pandemic. So really the, the uh, request in the letters, or sorry, in the correspondence, is that the uh, council would support a recently adopted motion from Belfast City Council. Now these, I understand, are the group as opposed to the, it's obviously not from the council itself, but uh, the people who submitted uh, some text to Belfast City Council for consideration. So really that's, uh, that is the request and they have also requested they our council buildings would be illuminated uh, on or near the day. Okay, I'm not seeing any speakers, so do we want to note the correspondence, members? Diana, note, Roy Segnan. Okay, thank you. And moving on then to 14.5. Yes, so Chair, this definitely is, is for noting. So this is really our correspondence that we sent to Monaghan, who were then the uh, Monaghan County Council, who were then the uh, administrators, coordinators of the A5N2 cross-border group, expressing the council's concern regarding the proposed change of name. They have duly circulated that around each of the partner councils, so that's the reason we're in receipt of it, and also noting that Mid-Ulster Mid is undertaking the administrative role for the next 12 months. Okay. Glenn? Can I go to Cahirley, and I suppose just to... As our chief executive has said, uh, our correspondence was noted in relation to the name change. And I suppose, you know, whilst it wouldn't have been our choice, um, I think everyone's serving on that committee from the various councils is united in terms of their support for the A5N2, um, for the dual carriageway, and also for the connecting uh, infrastructure, you know, in Donegal and, and Monaghan. Uh, so there's unity in terms of that, certainly. So, that, so I wouldn't get too hung up you won the name change, um, and I suppose for, for a lot of us, it'll be the A5N2 committee. We've kind of got used to saying that. I note the correspondence from our, our good friend and Monon, Councillor Brian McKenna, also signs it off as the A5N2 committee. Um, so uh, I suppose it's, 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 it's really a, not a huge concern. Uh, the important thing really is to see delivery. Uh, we do have a minister in, in, in place, of course, now, and we're, I, I have written to Minister O'Dowd uh, since his appointment, uh, um, to to I suppose reiterate uh, the urgency in relation to the delivery of the A5 road and uh, and to try and uh, ensure that there's no further delay um, in, in terms of the report from the PAC that that's considered and that decisions taken and that we get movement on delivery of the road because that that is what's really important here. Um, and I suppose he, in relation to Minister O'Dowd, he did meet with the A5N2 committee back in October 2022, and he was the interim minister at that time. So he's very much familiar with the role and, and with uh, the views of the committee in this council area and the other council areas. Uh, and indeed, on that occasion, he urged people to support uh, the inquiry. And many did choose to do that, including the families 
uh, most acutely affected who lost loved ones on the route. So um, I suppose uh, wishing the minister well in that regard, and hopefully we can see progress. Thank you, Chairman. Do you want to note the correspondent? I'm happy to note. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And a seconder. Thank you. Alan, that's current. Okay, have we, we have dealt with three in the course of the uh, should be yeah. Okay, members, that that works our way through. Uh, there's the other correspondence was dealt with. So we have uh, moved to point fifteen. Our notice of motion and our first is proposed by uh, John Feely and seconded by uh, Dermot Brown. So John, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. I'll take it everyone's read the motion. So we are proposing this motion and are hoping for support from across the chamber to ensure that our council will not award any contracts to companies involved in breaching human rights law and international law. If this ethical procurement policy were to be widely accepted by councils across the island, it would encourage companies to meet their human rights obligations. It is deplorable that any business should profit from pro protracted armed conflict, conflict and systematic violations of human right. rights. It is also unacceptable, unacceptable that our council could be in any way complicit with such profiteering. Ratepayers' money should not be used to fund businesses that profit off the back of suffering. By, by adopting an ethical procurement policy, this council will be able to implement a process to ex exclude businesses and companies involved in human rights and international law violations when, when tendering out bids. Our, polish, our policy should clearly implement criteria in, in accordance with the UN guiding principles on business, business and human rights and also in accordance with the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and for the global Sullivan Principles 1999. For too long, companies have profited on the death and destruction of communities and of men, women and children across the world. This is a small step in trying to stop that. Okay, thanks, John. Dermot? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, John has covered the, the main points of the motion, so I'll just say a couple of words. Uh, and really what this boils down to is that the, print, the principle that the repairs of this district have a right to expect that this council spends the money in such a way that we do not contribute to the suffering of people in other parts of the world. Unfortunately, it seems that we are moving backwards in terms of upholding human rights across the world. And we've seen this in Ukraine, in Yemen, and of course in Palestine as well. Uh, by taking this principle stand, we can make a real difference. Corporations that are supporting human rights abuse will quickly grow conscience when they see that their profits will take a hit. The motion, of course, will require training on the part of procurement officers, and we don't want to add an unreasonable amount of burden on them. Uh, but we, as the motion states, we should learn from best practice in this regard on how we can implement these changes. Uh, one example that I would give is that the UN Human Rights Council compiles a list of companies operating in illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Uh, and this, comp this list includes companies such as Airbnb, Booking.com and JCB. Uh, so that's the sort of information that we should be using to, to implement this policy. So just to conclude then, this is a, an example of something real that we can do to help Palestinians and other people around the world who are suffering from human rights abuses. And I hope that this motion is supported by every, the other parties in the chamber. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, I would um, obviously agree with um, John and Dermot there, but um, I also think it's important not just um, to ensure that workers get fair pay and um, that there's no exploitation or trafficking involved, but also that we're not dealing with countries where it's still illegal to be gay. So, you know, I think this is a really important um, motion 
um, and in particular for women and children and the men of Palestine as well. Thank you, Chair. I've got the question whether Council will be able to deliver such a wide-reaching policy with so many countries with horrific human and employment rights violations responsible for market manufacturing components and ingredients that for many products which are built and distributed through third-party operators or countries. Can the members bring in this motion forward, put their hands on their hearts and declare they don't purchase products from example, Russia, who exported 514,000 metric tonnes of oil to this country in 2022. Last year, our neighbours in the Republic of Ireland imported almost 400 million US dollars worth of goods from Russia. Can the proposers guarantee they didn't use any of these products? Let us look at Libya, a country where militias armed with and armed groups and security forces continue to arbitrarily detain thousands of people, scores of protesters, lawyers, journalists, critics and activists rounded up and subjected to torture and other illegal treatment, enforced disappearances and forced confessions on cameras, militias and armed groups used to unlawfully force, to re force people to uh, repress peaceful protests across the country. Dozens of people are arrested, prosecuted, or sentenced to lengthy imprisonment or death for their religious beliefs, for their actual or perceived gender identity and or sexual orientation or LGBT plus activation, activism. Almost three million metric tons of oil came from Libya to here last year. Can we guarantee that this council and we ourselves didn't purchase any of this oil? So we can't support this motion. We feel it cannot be sound in the way that they're asking us to enforce this. Thanks, John. Adam? Thank you, Chair. And I think human rights are tantamount, can't be ignored in any circumstances. And if we don't respect human rights, what principles do we have as, as elected representatives? I, I do look forward to seeing the, the development of this policy, and, and we will be supporting this, this policy. And on a note in terms of Councillor Coyle about notes about fair pay, uh, it just reminded me of, of a previous motion uh, adopted regarding becoming a fully accredited living wage council. Um, perhaps an update can be brought with that at some stage, um, perhaps in conjunction with developing this policy also. Whilst some of the policy may be difficult to implement, as Councillor McLaughlin has, has indicated, that shouldn't stop us from trying, Chair. We should try to do our bit, whatever we can, and we will be supporting this motion. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Mark? Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, we will not be supporting the motion. Um, like I believe this would put an extra strain on our procurement team. Uh, we haven't seen any even cost implications of what it would cost to bring in such a policy as is before us. Uh, so our party will be against the motion. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm not, I have no other speakers and I have dissent in the chamber on the motion, so I'm going to, uh, yeah, uh, before I do that, then bring John in. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to quickly point out on what John was saying, that's, I totally agree with him. We couldn't begin discriminating against businesses that are sourcing materials from places like Russia and stuff. That's not what this uh, motion is about. This motion is about companies that that are doing deals with with, with countries that are breaking international law, and and companies that are based in places like illegal settlements and stuff. Uh, I totally accept that you that you can't discriminate in grains of geographical scope of activity, social social location, or national identity or origin. That's not what this is about. This is about companies that are breaking international law by selling the countries that are breaking international law, such as JCP are involved in illegal settlements. It's on a list in the UN. So we this should not be burdensome, burdensome burden should some to our council staff. And if we I would also recommend also that it is imperative that during the development 
of, of the ethical procurement policy, Council seeks legal guidance the whole way through it in relation to logistical detail of the policy being adapted and implementation. Because I, I understand that this is going to be very tricky, but it is very doable and it, will, it really will, if enough councils do it, hit these companies in their pockets. And I'm talking about munitions companies, I'm talking about the companies that, that build the bombs that are dropped in, in, in Yemen and in Palestine and in Ukraine and in Syria and in Afghanistan. The, this, this is a very important one, but I do understand where you begin getting worried that we couldn't get a, take a tender from someone who sources a material in a country and stuff. That's not what this is about. This is about companies that are doing business with basic war criminals. So I'd like to thank everyone for taking part and it took on everyone's thing and hopefully I could have changed the mind of some of the parties and they might be able to vote with us now. Okay, thanks, John. And now I'm going to ask for a vote to be set up. So. Already, David, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just rebooting, you know, it's a bit of time and time. Just when it was going, then just restart. The same when you could log in. Yeah. Okay, we're in business now, so. Screen Where is our numbers? So it looks like it looks like twenty four. Two. What would you say that was? Eight. Ten. Eleven. Eleven. Okay. And maybe two. I don't think it's so. So mm. after that, two. Thirty six almost. Four and five, six. Seven. Plus you. It's twenty five. Plus one. It's 25 then. Is it right? This is 36. What's the thing again? 36. 34. 37. 24. It's 25. Oh, here we go. You can say it's very charcoal, it's just one percentage. Yeah. Yeah. What are we saying? That's 24 and a 25 and 11, mm -hmm. is it? That, and two, two abstaining. Does that even tell you?
Twenty-five, thirty-six, seven thirty-eight. That's thirty-eight out of thirty-six. And the middle one, ten. Believe in if it was ten. Twenty-five, ten. And two. That's thirty-seven. That was thirty-six. Oh, you. Yeah. Twenty-five, ten, two. Okay, members, after a little deliberation there, we have uh, that motion is carried 25 for 10 against and two abstaining. Okay, thank you. And we're going to move to our second uh, motion of this evening. And that is being proposed by uh, Barry and seconded by uh, Marty. So, Barry. Okay, thank you, Chair. Goramayagatakahili. You have the motion before you, and again, the Strudel Shared Education Campus was mentioned earlier in the meeting in the context of the letter from the principal of the Sacred Heart College in Oma, inviting people, encouraging people to go to the meeting on the 29th of this month. Uh, so there, there, there's a lot of interest in this, obviously, in the community. I suppose what sparked the recent interest was the independent review of education, you know, so-called investing in a better future, the independent review of education. Now, there's some good or good parts in that review, you know, emphasis on special education needs and early years and all of that. But item 10.38 recommended the immediate ending of the Strudel program and the transfer of fresh start resources to other education projects that in current circumstances could not be funded from the Department of Education's inadequate capital budget. Uh, so as a council then, we sought to meet with uh, Dr. Mark Brown, the permanent secretary in the department, and with uh, Suzanne Kingan, uh, director of infrastructure and investment. And Heather Cousins had been mentioned too as a possible attendee at the meeting, but as it transpired, uh, we met with Mark Brown and Suzanne Kingan, and it was a straightforward meeting. You yourself were present, Chair, and we were grateful for that. And uh, we looked back at the history of the Strudel Shared Educational Campus Project, um, what the purpose of it is, who it will benefit, uh, where the idea emanated from, transfer of the site, the former Lissonelli uh, Barracks, to the executive, for the purpose of an educational uh, village. So the recent meeting with Mark Brown uh, addressed the issue of the independent review. Where did that come from? And what was that about? And the permanent secretary uh, gave his statement to the meeting that that did not reflect the department's thinking. And then, of course, politically, we can all refer to expressions of support and statements of support and actions of support from previous uh, ministers. So that's the history of, of the campus, which is familiar to us all. You know, we didn't go into the specific detail of this year or that year, but that was a bolt out of the blue from the independent review team, and we wanted to address that. Now, the day that Mark Brown and Suzanne Kingan came to OMA, then they also met with the school leaders uh, as well, and out of that, um, comes a call for the incoming minister, uh, Paul Given, to reaffirm commitment from the Department of Education uh, to the Strudel uh, campus. So that's something that we'd want to achieve as well. You know, this evening is, is quite unique in that it's the first council meeting since the re-establishment of the executive, and we're all identifying our priorities and we're all seeking meetings with the relevant ministers. That's what we do. Uh, there's one thing I would say in the media recently, and if you listen to some commentators, they're challenging political parties and they're challenging elected representatives to be strategic. But sometimes that word strategic is used as a smokescreen for the stripping of services in Tyrone and Fermanagh. Uh, sometimes they're shameless about it in those television studios. You know, the commentator will say, Bengoa has been released. Why don't they just suck up 
the removal of services from their community. And it's always a, a, an urban person talking about a rural service. And the same goes for the Struil campus. It was mentioned in similar terms, you know, that, oh, you've got to be strategic. There's nothing more strategic than the Struil shared economic, uh, or sorry, education campus. But there's other ministers in the equation too, as we all know. Um, we need to seek engagement with the Minister of Finance as well, and with the, the Executive Office. Now, we have a recent letter from Michelle O'Neill, which was very helpful, uh, stating her support and ongoing commitment to the project. So that's very helpful. We did write to the other party leaders, but now it's down to business and uh, the letter is helpful. Uh, it, it points the way. Uh, it talks about good aspects of that report, but it also says we do not accept the recommendation to halt the Struhl shared education campus. I'll probably leave it at that because the motion's self-explanatory. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Barry. Marty. Thank you, Chair. I'm very happy to second the motion. Barry has covered quite a lot in his mm -hmm. uh, proposal there. So, uh, just I, I've been involved with the Student Education Campus Stakeholder Group for quite a number of years now, both as a councillor and as a local community representative. And while there have been a number of delays and setbacks since work began on the site back in 2013, I'm hopeful that now, with the restoration of the executive, we'll see a new momentum and new drive towards the completion and delivery of Stroud. Because the delivery of this flagship project will not only present fantastic educational opportunities to our young people going forward, but also it's crucial to the future growth and development of the town. It will provide the opportunity for the much needed community access to post pitches and other sporting and changing facilities connected with the campus, especially outside of school hours. The delivery of the education campus will open up the existing school sites in the town for future development. And the associated road improvements will be crucial to tackling traffic congestion in the town into the future. And as anyone who lives or works in the town will know, the Strathroy Link Road has already had a massive impact in reducing journey times, especially during rush hour. And it's also opened the north of Oma for potential development opportunities. Chair, the Stuart Education Campus is a project unique to this area, which promises great potential and opportunity for Roma and indeed for the entire district. And I would urge everyone to support the motion. Okay. Thanks, Barney. Er? Thank you very much, Chair. And thanks uh, to the proposer and seconder for bringing the motion forward. Uh, to me, as a Noma councillor, uh, born and raised, and with this still shared ed education campus, uh, like Councillor McCulligan had referred to, I've been in that stakeholder group since the outset of it many, many years ago. And it's been stop, start, stop, start. I welcome the meeting that we had with the uh, Mark Brown and Susan Kingan uh, on the 30th, uh, and especially when they did come to Oma and met us prior to going to meeting the principals of the various schools. So I, I welcome that and with some good engagement at that meeting. I suppose one of the things that did disappoint me on the day was, and I know it had been a big project all along, and to say that Reverend Secretary Secretary did outline that nothing was set in stone really, so it was all up for grabs again to see where we're moving from here. So I, I welcome the meeting on the day. I welcome the meeting that has been proposed uh, with the new education minister and the other assorted ministers and various ministers that we're going to meet on this issue. We have spent many, many years in this project and certainly for the county town of Oma, this is a vital project. I particularly refer to Oma High School. My old school, was, which was Oma County Secondary School at the time, it is in a dire state, a dire state, and that could not be more reinforced than that. I'm conscious that the other schools in the schools of state in the Ome area are not in a good condition either, but particularly Oma High School, and I have had the opportunity of a tour around it in the not too distant past. So I, I welcome it and uh, look forward to meeting with the principals that has been already outlined this evening as well in, in Arvalee Special School and Resource Centre. The thing that must be borne in mind here 
and people, and I know maybe that independent review was really looking possibly at integrated education uh, in a way. But the whole thing about the Stroud campus was that each school was to have its own identity at ethos. Each school was a standalone and they shared state-of-the-art facilities. So that's very, very important. And as I say, I look forward to it. And the Democratic Unionist Party group in here will be supporting the motion. And we look forward to the meetings. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks, sir. Josephine. Thank you, Chair. And thanks to Councillor McElduff and Councillor McCaughan for bringing forward this motion for debate this evening. Uh, it's certainly very timely particularly uh, given the fact that we now have a new Minister for um, Education. Um, I, I, I felt that the meeting with um, Dr. Brown and Ms. King on the 30th of January, uh, overall I felt it was quite positive, although clearly um, we, we, we still had a lot of concerns uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the ability of uh, our community to argue and refute uh, the assertions in the independent review of education. That was a review that was commissioned by a previous minister for education. And um, I think it would be um, unwise of us to assume that uh, their proposals regarding the Struhl education campus would, be, um, would not be taken seriously. But I honestly believe that we can refute those arguments. And I'm pleased that at the upcoming meeting on the 29th of this month, that uh, those school principals and the school community will be able uh, to uh, add ammunition uh, to our case in support of the Struhl Shared Education Campus. What was positive from the meeting, Chair, was that Dr. Brown emphasised his support and the support of his department for the progression of the Struhl Shared Education Campus. However, he did emphasize, Chair, that ultimately this would be a political decision. The business case has, has been completed, including all the advantages of progressing uh, this project, but ultimately it will be a political decision. And that's the importance, I think, of engaging uh, with our political leaders. And I thought that Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly's intervention earlier in the debate on this topic was very useful in that we are uh, inviting all the political parties to come and engage with us at that meeting. And I think that will be telling. Uh, it is good that the First Minister has already expressed her, cons her, her support for this project. Um, I note that uh, following, uh, you know, with the speeches at the formation of the new executive, that there was particular mention made of special educational provision. And, uh, you know, I think that given the current financial co uh, constraints that, you know, the various sectors will be competing, integrated education, special education, but I do hope that we can uh, uh, persuade the politicians of the importance of this project going forward. Because, Chair, as Councillor Thompson has said, our existing schools estate mostly is in a horrendous position. And Dr. Brown did say that at present, their maintenance budget is totally insufficient to renovate those schools. So I think that in the interests of uh, efficient use of public uh, funds, and given the amount that has been spent already on the project, I would be optimistic that this project will proceed. But I'm happy to support the motion, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Josephine. Werner? Thank you, Chair. And uh, the SDLP will be supporting the motion as well. Um, the Strudel Shared Campus has enjoyed the full support of the SDLP since the beginning. It's a unique and futuristic project that comprises all that is best about the ideals of a shared education, while at the same time delivering state-of-the-art educational facilities for our young people. The fact that successive executives have supported this development clearly points to its universal approval. My SDLP colleague, Daniel McCroston, the MLA for West Tyrone, stated, Strudel is key to the future of education in Oma and the surrounding areas and I'll be doing everything I can to ensure it goes ahead. The independent review has failed to grasp 
that the projected savings associated with scrapping the scheme leaves five schools in Oma with buildings in various states of disrepair. These buildings must be replaced or become the major subject of refurbishment at a massive cost to the public purse. There may be little savings in the, in, in the long run. Instead, losing a visionary campus will be the only legacy of such blinkered thinking. The SDLP acknowledges that there has been problems taking the scheme forward in a timely manner, and the resulting delays have contributed in no small way to raising costs. The problems have not been generated by the community, the schools, or parents and pupils. It would be grossly unfair to penalise them for matters beyond their control. Now is the time to progress this project with all possible speed. Therefore, the SDLP fully supports immediate and direct engagement with the incoming First Minister and Finance to ensure that adequate finances are available to take the project forward. And I thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Bernard. Stephen. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, uh, I thank the members for bringing this motion forward tonight and the uh, Alliance will be supporting. What was quite clear uh, during our engagement with the Permanent Secretary, particularly whenever I raised the question around the deficit in terms of capital financing capacity over the next number of years, is that there is going to be a substantial challenge in terms of the pressures that are going to be coming from a number of different directions, not least in terms of the demand to deliver Strul, but also in terms of the many pressures that are going to be there in terms of SEN provision, integrated and various other challenges that are going to be coming through the education sphere. And so in that sense, there is a very real need for clarity to be brought forward by uh, the new education minister in terms of how he plans to ensure that this is delivered in order to provide that clarity uh, to the schools who are involved in OMA. And I think that that's important to stress, which is that over the last number of years, indeed, it's now reached the point that it's decades, the school community in OMA has fully bought into Strul and have planned their futures in accordance with it. And many of them are now in substandard building conditions. And more than that, this, the, the wider community as a whole has bought into Strul to the extent that we have seen the transformation of the town as a whole, not least with the development of the Strathroy Link Road. So this is something that is massive. A commitment has been given, and it is absolutely necessary that clarity and an answer is provided to the school uh, schools involved as soon as possible. On the wider point in terms of the financial commitment, one of the things that I think is clear in terms of the challenges within education is that the 3.3 billion that has been secured as part of uh, the deal to restore devolution will go some way to dealing with some of the challenges but it will not be sufficient at most it will be a stopgap solution that will allow us to address some of the problems but will only take us through to maybe two years and so i think that that underlines the importance of the cross-party motion that was passed in the assembly today uh, with respect to finance calling on the uk government to ensure that we can secure a framework for financial stability in Northern Ireland that means that we can actually deliver on the priorities that have been set out to us, uh, particularly here in Fermanagh and Oma. So I think that the school community in Oma needs clarity, they need answers, and they need to make sure that there is prioritization given to this by the incoming minister, and Alliance will be giving its support to this motion. Okay, thanks Stephen. And Alan? Well, thank you, Chair. Thank uh, Councillor Michael Duff and Colgan for bringing forward the motion of the shared uh, education campus in Oma. I too attended the, the meeting with the Permanent Secretary and Suzanne. I must say that I wasn't terribly uh, convinced about uh, the pace that this, uh, this was uh, being processed at. Given the period of time that it has been on the statutory books, I couldn't believe it that, that uh, it would take so long to deliver. But there was one thing that the minister did say, and uh, uh, I, uh, I latched on to it, that uh, there is a big responsibility on all the schools involved to give their unreserved support uh, to the project. Otherwise, any of the schools 
and disrepair will suffer most. And I, I suppose I do refer to the Oma High School, which is virtually, you know, at the stage of crumbling. And if this doesn't go ahead, it leaves them in a very, very weak position to uh, uh, be able to draw down fun, funds for any restoration. So <clears throat> I would... Uh, I would call on the minister, uh, Minister uh, Given, to uh, give this project the support that it deserves and, and move it forward. And uh, the Ulster Unionist Party will support the motion here this evening. Thank you, Chair. OK. Thanks, Alan. That concludes our speakers here. So I'm going back to uh, Barry to sum up. And uh, thank members for their contribution to the, the debate and the, you know, the cross party, uh, all party support on this. Also to thank the chief executive for attending that meeting as well on the day in question. It was important to have uh, the leadership of the, of the council in that meeting. It was great. Um, we don't want to see this project slipping. You know, year on year we've heard about slippage. You know, for example, September 2027 is sometimes spoken of. You know, will that slip to September 2028? We need to keep our eye on it, maintain our, vig our vigilance. But on the positive side, a lot has happened already. You know, for example, the building of the Arvilly School, uh, the site clearance and preparation for the other five schools is underway. The building of the Strathroy Link Road you know, specifically for this purpose. And I think it was Councillor McColgan at the meeting reminded us of the Riverside Spur. That's a future bit of uh, work to be carried out. The widening of the road is, is about to happen. In. You know, um, the whole TransLink preparations. Um, there's also curricular work that has been taking place. You know, the principals have worked together for years now um, and would like to see that, you know, uh, gain pace as well but try to keep our eye on the deadline of september 27 and try and not let it slip and and full full speed ahead to the project i say thank you chair okay thanks barry and i'm not uh detecting any dissension in the chamber so i'm putting it that we're all uh, agreed on the motion yeah okay thank you members that's all passed we're moving to our third motion now tonight, and that is proposed by Seamus and seconded by Anthony. So, Seamus, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am bringing this uh, motion tonight because I believe it's uh, one chance that we have to influence uh, the negotiation for government uh, in the upcoming Stormont. I believe every one of the projects that I have listed uh, this council has supported previously in one way or another um, I don't believe there's one project in this here that hasn't been debated in the council over the years I'm a councillor from 2010 or 11 I believe and every single one of these has been uh, debated and supported by every member past and present in this chamber. Uh, so I am looking for uh, all party support for this here so that um, we can align all the projects together in one document uh, and send it up to uh, the parties in Stormont. When negotiations is going forward, I realize that uh, everything's not going to be delivered overnight or over the next year or even maybe over the next decade. But I would hope that when the negotiations are, are happening and as ministers take their departments, that they will remember from Ananoma that uh, our projects doesn't slip to the bottom of the pile. What has happened uh, previously over the last 100 years we have uh, had our funding and our services cut time and time again. 
uh, even as this meeting has progressed, all of these or mo a lot of these here has been brought up by one councillor or another from uh, various parties. Uh, so I am looking for full support for this. And uh, uh, for instance, the likes of the SWA, uh, many times have we talked in this council about trying to get um, uh, the elective uh, general surgery back to SWA. Well, this is one opportunity that we have that this will be actually debated among the parties uh, while um, the negotiation for government is taking place. I believe that all of the other things, the A5, the A4, the farm funding, uh, all has been debated. Uh, they're all red in the face. Um, we have talked about Invest NI previously in the recent months about the inequality that has happened over the years there. So I am expecting uh, full support for this motion and uh, I am hoping that when it does go to the parties in Stormont that they will look favourably and maybe uh, not forget us uh, while these negotiations are going forward. So I recommend the motion to the Chamber. Okay. Thanks, Seamus. And Anthony? Thank you, Chair. Well, well, I'm not going to say much because um, the, the motion is self-explanatory there and, and Seamus has covered everything. Well, let, well, just like most other councillors here in the Chamber, I was glad to see the Assembly get up and running last uh, Saturday afternoon after a long break and um, see ministers put in, in, in place. Just like to, to wish all the ministers the best, best of luck and that they can do as much as they can for the for the people in our council area here and invest a bit of money west of the band. So I'll, I'll formally just second the motion. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Anthony. Patrick? Yep. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Councillor Green and Councillor Philly for bringing on this motion tonight. It's important that a focus is brought to uh, these key projects and priorities for our council area and now that we've the institutions restored. However, it is also important that we recognise the delivery of these projects and adequate funding for our public services also depend on proper funding from the British government, where the powers of taxation currently lie. I therefore welcome one of the first moves by the new executive has been to write to the, the British government to press for a funding package which will help tackle the challenges that exist across our public services. While partition remains, which remains a disadvantage to us maximising our potential, it is also important that we use the North-South Ministerial Council for greater collaboration on an all-island basis to progress these priorities, such as the A5 dual carriageway. Indeed, I was pleased to hear a renewed commitment from the new Infrastructure Minister, John O'Dowd, on delivery of the A5 just this afternoon, and he highlighted the importance of the financial contribution from the Irish Government for delivering that project. Having a Minister intervene in these projects shows just how vital it is that we have the institutions in place and that they've now been restored, so I welcome and support the motion. Mayor Margaret. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Stephen? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, Alliance is more than happy to support the motion. I mean, as I said earlier, the rationale for the finance motion that was passed in the Assembly today uh, was the fact that whilst we have a stop-go solution in terms of the funding that has been um, brought forward as part of the deal to restore Stormont, ultimately, if we want to achieve the aspirations that people have, uh, particularly on the capital expenditure side, uh, many of the projects that we want to see brought forward, then ultimately we need to reach a financially sustainable framework. So I know that uh, Minister Archibald will have a, a pretty tough job on our hands in that respect, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to see progress in due course on that particular matter. And I think that it is important that we as a council do continue to stress the priorities that we're hearing from our constituents uh, in terms of uh, the A32, in terms of the A5, in terms of the new mental health unit. And in particular, I do want to stress just uh, once again in the context of this debate, the huge strategic importance of the A5 upgrade, not least in terms of road safety and making sure that we have the infrastructure necessary to, to, be, to ensure that we save lives in future. So happy to leave it there, Chair, and to confirm Alliance's support for the motion. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Adam? Thank you, Chair. Firstly, to state that the SDLP will, will of course be supporting this motion. Uh, when I was reading this motion initially uh, and saw it was going to set out a, a list, I know Councillor Green and Councillor Feely are both very vocal on, on raising many issues, so I'm sure they had about a 20-page draft when they started this of priorities, as we all would, lists as long as we're of our arms. But I do think they've distilled down into a succinct 
list of significant kind of flagship style projects that we can all get behind and we will all get behind on this occasion with this motion, I hope. I think whether this is delivered or not, and, and I do wholeheartedly agree with the, the sentiment and direction of this motion and the ask, the evidence will be in what comes forward. Proof will be shown over the next three years. But regardless of how the executive and the executive parties do or don't deliver on this, I know I'm confident that, that all the councillors in this chamber uh, will continue to be strong advocates for the issues that matter to us in this area. We, we kind of have to be. Not too many people are loud for us, so we'll keep up doing that together, I hope. Uh, but thank you to the two councillors for bringing forward this motion. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Josephine? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, thanks to Councillor Green and Councillor Feely for bringing forward this motion. And uh, as Councillor Green has said, I think it really reflects uh, the debate that we have had uh, in this in uh, our Council over many years. Um, I particularly uh, welcome uh, the uh, proposed prioritisation of rural GP services. We know, uh, Chair, that um, primary care services are really challenged at the moment. They are in need of huge investment, and especially in rural areas of Fermanagh and Oma. This, I think, and I hope, will be an important priority uh, for Minister Swan uh, as he takes up uh, his office. Uh, the infrastructural projects, uh, the A5, the A4, the A32, the Enniskillen Bypass, all really, really important for our council area. Uh, for our economic uh, uh, development and also for uh, the safety of all of our uh, road users. And uh, finally then, uh, Councillor Green and Feely references the Stroud Education Campus, which we've already debated, and the new mental health unit for OMA. And I think that this is a project uh, that has largely, in my view, been forgotten about. Uh, it's long been promised as a development of the uh, Oma Hospital, and given uh, the the challenges faced uh, by people in regard to their mental health, and uh, the inability of the trust uh, to provide comprehensive mental health services to all our constituents, I think that it would be really an injection an injection of funding uh, would um, serve to highlight the priority. Uh, that the new minister uh, will give to the provision of mental health services and the new mental health unit in Oma Hospital. So I'm happy to support this motion, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chair. Keith? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Well, we'll be happy to support the motion. I see there is an amendment in underneath. Where does that come into play? Because obviously we'd support it with, with the amendment in. If it... If somebody is proposing the amendment to uh, speak to it, uh, we'll have an amendment. No, I just I see it's on the... <laughs> is that going to be proposed, is it? Uh, yeah, I do believe no, it is. No, well, as I say, I know as a, as a party, and we've heard it here tonight, and like other parties, I know we've all been talking, I suppose, in our respective parties with regard to priorities and going forward, and uh, it's just good uh, to see that... Uh, Stormont is up and running again, and uh, that hopefully we can see some delivery coming back, uh, coming back down the road again. So we're happy to uh, support the motion with the amendment. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I just want to amplify the part of the motion which refers to the acute mental health unit in Oma. That is really, really important. It was committed to previously by uh, ministers. I remember talking to Edwin Poots personally and privately about the urgency of this more than 10 years ago. And uh, it seemed to slip down, you know, the stop-start nature of Stormont. Things slipped off the table. That's one that needs to be put back on the table in a major way. And if you take, for example, now, um, the, the and people talk about the fabric of buildings, talk about lime and elm, in Oma, they're in very, very poor condition physically. And there's a serviced site over at the Oma Hospital and Primary Care Complex, a waiting development, a service site. 
adjacent to the hospital awaiting development. And just on a related note, I don't think we've ever received correspondence back from the Trust on concerns we've raised about Lyme and Elm and uh, recreation facilities uh, for people who find themselves there, particularly females, uh, the absence of recreation facilities is a concern that we've raised previously as a council and uh, we've never got an answer. Thank you, Chair. Okay, we'll follow that one up, Barry, and see if we can get something. Uh, Diana? Thank you, Chair, and apologies. I, I got my sequencing wrong there. Chair, I'd like to, to welcome um, the motion brought forward by Councillor Green and Councillor Feely. These are issues that have been brought to almost everybody in the chamber, I'm sure, in fact, everybody. And it's good to see the unanimity there because every project listed here and the priorities are really essential for the growth and prosperity of this, this district. Um, I would like to propose um, an amendment to, to add um, a request for the advancement of the um, ERGS site, the, the ERGS project, the, the, the new build for the school, the amalgamated school between the Enniskill and Grammar, Collegiate Grammar School and Pretoria Royal School. Those schools um, amalgamated in 2016. I think they've been operating from a split site from that time. So it's a request that um, that is added to the Fermanagh projects as something that needs to be advanced as well with the support um, as an amendment with the support in the chamber. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Diana. And John? Thank you, Chair. And obviously, I'd like to second Diana's proposal to amend the motion. I'd like to congratulate the councillors on bringing forward this motion. And uh, I'm sure that whilst there's numbers there, that does not reflect the order in which, which they wish any of these things or any of us do. Not one of these projects is, has a priority to any of the others. And, uh, and all of them would need to be completed and are equally as important. The reason why we're proposing the amendment for the ERGS the Enniskill Royal Grammar School is that uh, it is now eight years since the amalgamation. We've had a full crop or a generation of students who have known nothing but travelling across Enniskill for classes, for PE, for sports. And uh, the amount of time they spend in cars, if they use their own private cars or minibuses, or just simply walking if they take it into their head to walk, is unreal to walk across Enniskill or to try and drive in it in a car. It's uh, ridiculous that at this stage they've still gone that stage. The school itself is on the Batura Hill is 250 years old very shortly and uh, it's definitely shown its age and it has a lot of crinkles in it that could do with being nabbled out. Okay. And our last speaker is Victor. Thank you, Chair. Well, certainly I want just to come in in support uh, of the motion and the amendment. Um, certainly, there's a lot of of good uh, of good stuff on all these projects. Um, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of uh, there's going to be another ten council areas with their hands out as well, and uh, certainly we're going to need a, a further injection of capital coming from somewhere. Um, certainly, on the on the on the ergs. There's 965 pupils at the ERGS. I've been reliably informed uh, a few minutes ago. And to have it on a on a split site on an island town is not really is not really suitable because uh, it, it's maybe some of the, I'm not sure if I know all the sort of Fermanagh based councillors will know uh, the split how it is. Um, maybe some of the Oma ones won't, but it it's really really is awkward. Uh, with with kids having to go from uh, one site to another, um, they're basically crossing a river. Uh, so certainly w would uh, support that amendment as well. So thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Victor. Okay, that concludes all our speakers. So the first thing I'm going to do is put the amendment. Have I got agreement for Seamus? Uh, I wasn't sure what whether you were going to do that, but could I just, before we'll go to the amendment, just speak on it? I didn't know you were going to go straight to, the, to that uh, uh, vote. I and we... Hold on. You have spoken on it, Jim, so you can sum up. But I no, no, but uh, this is on the amendment. I haven't spoken on the amendment. Okay. Um, so 
Uh, we put the, the proposal together uh, and we didn't really go down into them type of individual, like my local school has been looking for a shared campus for uh, over 10 years. We didn't put that in. Uh, I would 100% back the Ulster Unionist Party if they put that in as a, as a, a standalone amendment. But there's three proposals here from uh, OMA, there's three from, from, from Anna, and there's then four general ones. Uh, and that was deliberately done that way. Like, if we all come in with our own projects, as I say, I would 100% support the, uh, a standalone uh, motion. Uh, you know, I have nothing, but I just think that this wasn't intended to be for that type of issue. It was more regional projects that we want uh, uh, to, to get the, the, the motion on the school absolutely was supported but on this ask uh, on this so I, I i'm not really i'm not gonna uh, go against it but i'm just explaining that i think it possibly should have been done another way as an individual motion rather than uh, that rather than stewing the spewing the thing now that there's four from anna wants three oma you know that's all i'm saying if that had been an individual motion i would have been more than happy to to support okay Thanks, Seamus. I, I'm looking at uh, Diana and John to see uh, their reaction if they want to. Oh, I have a plan. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, hold on just for a little. Okay, so I just want to to uh, check. I am allowed to ask if you want to hold your amendment uh, as you have stated or withdraw the amendment. Chair, I want to hold the amendment. Um, I, uh, I wasn't looking at it in terms of um, a, a geographical split within the, the district. I just thought it was a current topic. No, that's grand. Thank you. It's grand. Thank you. I just and want to. Uh, could I request a recorded vote, please? Okay. Thank you. Specifically to yeah. And we want a recorded vote. Yes. Once I start, I'm, I'm not opening it to everybody here. So, no. John? Just, I don't think there was any dissension here. It was just. The question of it being put forward so i think we might be able just to go with yeah if you want to ask the question yeah 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 so i'm putting the amendment as as stated by diana and seconded by john to the to the meeting is there any objection to that no so then that's included to be the substantive motion so in that case then i have an, a chairman to sum up um, yeah, um, thanks for that. Um, just to, to make it clear, I will, I'm not, nor wasn't saying I was against the, the, the spirit of the amendment. I was just saying it probably could have been done in a, in a separate motion. Uh, so anyway, it's, uh, it's done. Um, I just want to point out that um, somebody said there, I think it was uh, Councillor Warrington, said that it was, a, you know, we were competing against 10 other, or there was going to be another 10 councils uh, in on this. But I don't think there is, the other 10 has sent this document to any uh, to the executive. So, you know, maybe for once we are in there first, and uh, maybe for once our uh, priorities will get looked at first, you know. 
And then if the other 10 come in, well, they'll be maybe seen as Johnny come late. At least, you know, we, are, we, we got in there first. So, uh, uh, no, I'm happy to, to um, uh, put the proposal to the chamber and hopefully get full support. OK, thanks, Seamus. And I'm now formally putting the proposal with the amendment included to the floor. Uh, have I got agreement? Great. OK, that's passed. Thank you, members. And I believe that uh, I have covered the any other business to all of the members that raised any other business, bar young Stephen. Thank you, Chairman, uh, and thanks for your indulgence, Chair, and for speaking to you earlier today about these two these two items. The first piece, Chair, I just want to speak briefly on an event that was at at the weekend uh, in Derry. So just before the Throne and Derry League match. Uh, several hundred people assembled at, at Free Dairy Corner in an initiative organised by the, the GEA and the Pat Finucane Centre. And that was just to show solidarity uh, with the uh, family of Patsy Kelly from Trillick and from, uh, with Sean Brown from Balai. Uh, it was a remarkable sight just to see the, the, the people walking up the hill towards Celtic Park in unity uh, with, one, with, with one message, and that is just to oppose the Cruel Legacy Act. Uh, that, that's been passed. Uh, just before the, the parade commenced, there was a number of speakers and, and Patsy Kelly Jr.'s remarks. And Patsy Kelly was obviously Patsy Kelly's son, who, who his mother was carrying at the time of his murder. Uh, Patsy spoke about, about his, his late father's search and uh, the role the GEA played in that particular time, the three weeks from his murder till his body had been found, and how they you know organised the community and made the facilities available to, to the local people and indeed the family. And uh, of course, Siobhan, Siobhan Brown spoke about her, her family's terrible loss following the murder of, of, of their father in Belahi in 1970, sorry, 1997 by the LVF. And I suppose uh, they spoke about their journey for truth and justice and the pain that they have experienced. And of course, there's many other families across the district and indeed across the north who are impacted by this cruel legacy bill as well. So, Chair, just a couple of words just to commend the GEA uh, and the Pat Finucan Centre for organising this initiative, which I know has, has provided some comfort to the Kelly and Brown families. The second piece of uh, AOB, Chair, I want to raise with you is in relation to the extortionate increase in insurance premiums. And that's something I think everybody in this chamber will will be experiencing if or if they haven't experienced they will be experiencing at their at the renewal dates and indeed i've been speaking to many people over the last couple of weeks uh, about about this you know so over the last 12 months or more uh, insurance premiums have gone through the roof with many consumers seeing their premiums more than double or more without any claims being made so for the first time the average car insurance premium here in the north is in the region of a thousand pounds you know that's some increase from from what it was just a short while ago and this is putting a huge strain on already stretched households. So whilst everybody recognises, of course, that insurance premiums can fluctuate for various reasons, such extortionate increases can only lead to the conclusion that consumers here are being ripped off. So like, even if you do a quick, a quick uh, Google search, you can see like, some of the headlines, Alliance profits, so, sorry, Alliance profits jump. Alliance profits jump by fifth or up to 50 million. Abbey boosts profits by 15%. So, you know, the, the insurance companies is profiteering all the while our uh, constituents are, are feeling the pinch. So the question I have is, who holds these insurance companies to account? So on that basis, Chairman, can I propose that we write to the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA, and the Prudential Regulatory Authority, I think that's correct, that's the PRA, to investigate these spiraling car insurance and home insurance costs. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Anthony. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Stevie, for bringing that up. And I'll just second Stevie's proposal there for, funny enough, I was chatting the fella last night, a young fella just, just started the drive and he was quoted 2,600 for insurance and I thought it desperate. And, and he, it's, it's overly doubled, so I'm just I'm glad Stevie brought that out as second proposal. Okay, members, on any other business, it's the person that, that take notifies me of the any other business they get speaking on if it's something like that it's just a second and that's where we draw the line on that so uh we have that proposed and seconded by um stephen and anthony we're all agreed there 
Okay, and Adam, you had a second piece? Yes, and apologies, Chair, for not standing at the table, but did discuss with the Chief Executive just to, to notify Council that um, I'll be standing down from the audit panel and as a grouping will not be renominating. Just with training and officer advice, it proves that, um, that, that we can't influence policy. If you're on the audit panel, we think that's an important role for councillors. So uh, I'm aware that there needs to be considerations to uh, the composition of that now. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Adam. Okay, that concludes the uh, any other business. So we're going to, uh, can I have a proposal? Thanks, Paul and Mark there for Cygnus to go into confidential and we'll get a little nod.
if you just give us a wee minute, members, before you start moving. And then can I ask Alison just to give us a little resume of what happened? Thank you, Chair. While in committee, the Council confirmed and signed the confidential minutes of the Council meeting held on the 9th of January, uh, and there were no, or there, sorry, received a, a matters arising in relation to one item. Confirmed the confidential minutes of the Planning Committee meeting held on the 14th of December 2023, there were no matters arising. The confidential report of the Regeneration and Community Committee held on the 16th of January of this year and adopted the minutes. Again, uh, there were no matters arising and considered a confidential report of the Policy and Resources Committee meeting held on the 17th of January 2024 and received a, a brief verbal update on uh, one matter that had been discussed at the meeting. Uh, the Council also received a verbal update on recommendations from the Planning Committee held on the 24th of January and it uh, resolved a course of action in relation to the recommendations presented. Okay, Josephine proposing and Diana seconded. We all agreed. Okay, members, that concludes the business. Thank you all for your cooperation and safe home.